um, uh, City of Port Phillip meeting. I declare it to be open. I welcome all the members of the public who are here tonight. The City of Port Phillip respectfully acknowledges the Yalakut Willem clan of the Bunwurrung language group and we pay our respects to their elders both past and present. We acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to this land. So uh, council has a local law that determines how this meeting will be conducted and I'll try to remember all of it. Um, there is a time uh, allocated in tonight's agenda for public question time. Uh, and there's a second opportunity for the community to contribute, uh, to uh, um, not only to ask a question, but also make a comment on any specific item in tonight's agenda. So this will be done prior to the councillors talking about um, matters concerning the item. If you wish to ask a question or speak to a report, please complete, complete the blue form from uh, available at the table just outside the chamber and hand it to a staff member. I really encourage you to limit your questions and comments to uh, three minutes and to avoid repeating any points that have already been made by other speakers. So the non-repetition rule will be strictly enforced tonight because it could be a long meeting. Could I say something about the budget? We have already had a special council meeting to take public submissions on the budget. I will accept them further submissions with some reluctance, but um, my, uh, my sense is that we should limit those submissions to one minute and please try not to repeat anything that's already been said at the, um, at the uh, special council meeting. Please note also that council meetings are now being live streamed. The live streaming recording allows people to watch uh, and listen to the meetings in real time, but um, it's un I think it's, it's true to say that whilst your voice will be recorded, you will not be on the uh, camera face first. Please note also in accordance with Council's local law that this meeting cannot be filmed or audio taped without permission being granted by the Mayor and in the unlikely event of an emergency evacuation, please follow the instructions of the Chief Warden. Um, apologies. Councillors, we have one apology tonight which is Councillor Voss. Can I have a motion in relation to that? Move Councillor Baxter, seconded Councillor Copsey. All those in favour, that's unanimous. Minutes of the previous meetings. Councillors, the minutes of the special council meeting of, um, that was held on the 4th of June 2019 and the ordinary meeting of council held on the 5th of June 2019 have been circulated. Are there any questions in relation to these minutes? Uh, if not, can I have a motion to confirm the minutes? Moved uh, Councillor Bond, seconded Councillor Pearl. I'll now put the motion. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Declarations of conflict of interest. Does anyone have a conflict of interest? Uh, I, in fact, do. I, Councillor Dick Gross, declare that in relation to item 4.1, a petition for request of CCTV in Carlisle Street, Balaclava, that I have an indirect conflict of interest by way of a close, close association. And I'll be removing myself from the chamber when that petition is presented. And I'll request uh, the Deputy Mayor to take the chair for, this, for that item. Um, and there's no others. Uh, councillors, we're getting pretty quick to it. Um, we have two petitions tonight. Item 4.1, petition requesting CCTV in Carlisle Street. And um, I'm going to say, I, Councillor Dick Ross, declare that in relation to item 4.1, petition, request for CCTV in Carlisle Street, Balaclava, that I have an indirect conflict of interest by close association. 
Madam Deputy Mayor, could I request that you take over? Okay, so uh, councillors, we are receiving item 4.1, the petition requesting CCTV in Carlisle Street, Balaclava. And we have received one request from the members of the public to speak to this item. So I'd now call on John Webster to please come up to the chair, announce your name and the suburb you live in, please, and then speak to the petition. Uh, John Webster, St Kilda Branch of the Liberal Party. I live in Balaclava. A few weeks ago, I walked up and down Carlisle Street and received 130 signatures for people who work in that street wanting CCTV security cameras in Carlisle Street. Only, only five people declined to sign, um, particularly people didn't feel safe between the bridge and um, Chapel Street. And I, I probably use that word um, some people felt fear. Um, yes. Was there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, uh, not really. No, no? That, that's, uh, it was one of the easiest petitions I've ever made. Okay, thank you very much, Mr Webster. So, councillors, do we have any questions of the officers in regards to this petition? No. Uh, so then we have our officer's recommendation. Would someone like to move this or something different? Uh, Councillor Bond, is that, do I have a seconder? Councillor uh, Baxter has seconded. So uh, Councillor Bond, would you like to speak to the motion? I'd um, just like to thank John for taking the initiative to go down there and survey the traders down on, on Balaclava uh, Street and Carlisle Street and Balaclava, letting us know what, what they feel. Um, I think at some point in time in the future it's inevitable there will be CCTV on Carlisle Street but we have some areas of St Kilda proper that need slightly more attention that we need to get to first and then at some point in time in the future who knows we may be able to look at putting CCTV down there. Thank you. Councillor Baxter. Um, yeah, so uh, yes, uh, thanks to the petitioners for putting this in. Um, I don't uh, think I've ever... Uh, received a petition from a political party before, but um, thanks to the St Kilda branch of the Liberal Party for uh, doing this, I suppose. Um, I, I, I guess council is uh, doing, uh, is considering uh, the entire scope of what we do with CCTV um, and uh, measuring the effects of it in, in, in various areas and developing a policy in that respect. So I'd like us to have an evidence base uh, before we come back and, and consider this. Uh, and um, that's what this recommendation says, so yeah. Are there any other councillors who wants to speak for or against their petition, being or the recommendation? No. Uh, Councillor Bond, would you like to close the debate? Uh, yeah, just to clarify John's role. John is a member of the St Kilda branch of the Liberal Party. He's not here representing the St Kilda branch of the Liberal Party. As president of that particular branch, um, I can assure you that that hasn't been discussed at a, a branch meeting. Um, he's here just as a member of the public who, every time he comes to speak to us, Johnny announces himself as a member of the St Kilda branch, which is 100% accurate. He's entitled to do that. All right, given that, uh, I will now put the motion all in those in favour, all those against. Okay, so that was uh, passed, motion passed. Uh, I declare the motion carried. Um, so now at this point I will ask Mr Chick to bring uh, the Mayor back in and he will resume taking the Chairperson's duties. Thank you. Okay, I sense... I sense we've got another petition. We do. Um, um, item 4.2 is a petition opposing the proposed development at 1 to 5 Tiona Grove, Elwood. Um, can I just make a, a quick 
statement that um, there was an officer's recommendation, but in late breaking news, the um, officer's recommendation has been dramatically altered. Um, due to some further information that's been received from a heritage advisor. So, um, just so that you know that when you speak. So, we have several people who've requested to speak. Uh, can I ask you to sit in the seat, say your name and suburb, and, uh, and uh, make sure that the microphone's turned on. Ruth Jones. <laughs> there was a little bit of a clap there. <laughs> yes. It's not the best. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Ruth Jones. I live at number 18, Tiuna Grove, Elwood. Uh, I would uh, ask uh, the councillors... First of all, I would like to thank the council and the council staff for uh, their decision to object to the proposal uh, to this point. Uh, we very much hope that uh, the council will continue to oppose the amended application. Uh, I will be brief. Uh, the proposal in the proposed development, its bulk, 1,500 square metres, and taller than any current building in the street, uh, is uh, quite excessive. Uh, the overlooking for uh, the residents uh, in Bendigo Street and at 1A Tuna Grove uh, is intrusive and cannot be um, managed via uh, uh, landscaping. Uh, traffic in an extremely narrow street and a narrow residential street uh, will be impossible and construction noise and disruption will be uh, very um, disruptive. Uh, so I would simply ask that in summary, uh, this is an inappropriate development in a narrow residential street in a neighbourhood residential zone and that uh, council continue to uh, oppose uh, this development. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ruth. Elvis de Jong. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, Elvis de Jong, number six, Bendigo Avenue in Elwood. Um, I, I'm here to present to council the petition that was um, started on um, change.org. We started this petition just over two weeks ago. I was hoping to proudly sit here and say we have 500 signatures. Currently, when I checked, uh, it was... Uh, 1,586 just before I left home. So uh, to say that it has been um, has been uh, has struck a chord is is really is really an understatement. Uh, I'm overwhelmed by the support in the community for this petition. Um, the I note the council's um, continued objection at VCAT to the revised plans this afternoon. Um, that was sent through um, just before. So I uh, had a great long speech planned and, I, and I'm absolutely certain it would have been very convincing and, uh, uh, and very eloquent, but uh, I'm glad I don't have to go through that speech now. Um, so th I thank the council and congratulate the council for and the officers for really standing up to what would be a, and what will be if this development goes ahead, a catastrophic blow to the planning scheme. The planning scheme that seeks to restrict this kind of development to the growth zones and seeks to protect uh, the residential zones. So I thank the council for uh, its rejection of that, um, uh, its continued rejection of the plan. Um, I would, though, further like to stress to the council 
the, um, uh, the, the heritage nature of, in particular, number one and number five, um, Tuna Avenue. And I would, and I note the, the council's officers work in, in, in trying to um, put something forward that will protect these properties. And I urge the council to take the next steps and to submit this to the minister for, an in, for interim protection. Uh, this is vitally important, and I think we have another speaker that will talk about, in particular, number three, Tuna Grove, which has a, a long history. Tuna Grove itself is a very important street in the history of Elwood. It is one of the first streets in the development of Elwood and has significant properties on that street, and we do need to protect this, this street and the heritage. Um, as we've said right from the outset of this, um, this petition and, and this movement to try and stop this development, we are not opposed to development. We support 100% the planning scheme. We support development along the corridors, along the, the growth corridors as they have been identified. What we would like the council to do and what we would like the community to do is to protect the built heritage in the smaller streets, in the, in the, in the residences, so that, these, the, so that the, the character of Elwood can be saved for the next generation and the generation after. Elwood is not a, uh, a low-density suburb. It, called, sorry. Uh, I could go on. <laughs> I get that, but thanks very much for your forbearance in uh, foregoing your long speech. And congratulations on the uh, extraordinary success of your petition. Uh, Roberto Schuter. Roberto, could I ask you to read your name into the record and your suburb? Yes, my name is Robert Schuter and I live in St Kilda East. Um, I'm a professional film and theatre director for 40 years and a journalist and an advocate for animal rights and I lived at Tuna Grove for 14 years. Um, my um, discussion tonight is going to be fairly informal. I've done a lot of research so I'll be re referring to what I've written and researched. Um, this is about money. This is about profits. This is about the disappearance and destruction of our most precious historical and cultural landscape, making development, developers' wallets fatter than they already are. Um, at the CAT hearing on Tuna Grove in February 2010, iconic playwright Julia Britton stated, quote, a great deal of spirit and substance of Elwood has been recorded on these premises. Even writers and artists from the US and other countries have visited us after hearing the work that we do. So much would be lost if the house and the reputation we have created were lost." Unquote. Recently, um, funny enough, I was reading um, an article in The Guardian Online, and it was about um, developers and council. And this quote stuck out in my memory, so I'm just going to read it out. Um, the subheading of the article was, quote, "'Fighting developers is like a horror film. The monster keeps on coming back.'" Unquote. I'm sure many of the Alwood residents would hardly agree with that. Um, the historical dwelling at Tree Turina Grove is a rare example of period home which virtually retains all its original interiors and structures. In particular is the famous Red Room, the original dining room, which still boasts of its beautiful Tudor-style wooden beams um, and wall-to-wall -wall ceiling panels. Many artistic endeavours and lively events have taken place in the Red Room over many years. It was a bright red, I know, I painted it. Um, I also are led to believe that there's no other red brick federation style dwellings in the surrounding areas. The preservation of the heritage houses such as number three should be protected for the education and in, in, in enjoyment of future generations. So why has it number three received a heritage overload when other buildings have nearby? In February 2007, the, the residents of number seven, Tuna Grove, contacted the City of Port Phillips Department of Planning via email stating the house has not been yet classified by the Heritage Council, but we understand that the matter is being considered. Well, nothing was ever done with that consideration to ensure number three survival. Um, the dwelling was built circular 1912 by a gentleman, an Aussie digger, in the Australian Imperial Force. 
um, on lot two of three lot purchases, which included a 100-year restrictive covenant. In 1922, Leslie Taylor, known as Squizzy Taylor, um, was in hiding in the back room of number three after fleeing, dressed as a schoolboy, I might add, um, from another hideout house in Glen Hartley Road in Elwood. The story goes on. In the 40s, the tenant, then tenant was killed in the Second World War. The dwelling then became a share house in the late 80s, full of young men who had car parts strewn all over the property. However, in 1994, the famous Australian playwright, Julia Britton, then aged 88, leased the property. That's when everything changed. The back garden originally had three large and magnificent 100-year-old palm trees, two of which have disappeared and one that remains and has been threatened many times before. Um, a spectacular 100-year flowering gum tree originally stood in the front yard of the property. The tree enjoyed many cockatoos, larrikeets and wattle birds that the residents loved and enjoyed. This was put forward in the original um, application to VCAT. Sadly, it was surprisingly destroyed for no apparent reason in 2006 by the then owners and with furious onlookers. How is this allowed to happen? Julia Britton wrote 14 or um, more successful plays in number three to Unigrove, many of them produced worldwide. From 1994 to 2016, the dwelling became well known as a creative hub under Britain's tenancy. 18 plays, eight screenplay readings and workshops in the Red Room, along with numerous rehearsals for award-winning stage productions of The Death of Peter Pan, the award-winning In Angel Gear, the successful Half a Person, the acclaimed object of desire just amongst them. Sorry, we have to wind it up. OK, um, just jump down. It was, um, the house has also had many films done there. Um, and I'll just jump down to um, the following list of famous people, just a couple I want to mention. First of all, um, Dr Michael Kosminski, George uh, Munchnicki, Paul Cox, the filmmaker, John Clark, the TV commentator, Jane Turner from Kath and Kim, Heather Elliott, artist, Anthony Bred, uh, Breslin artist, maestro Richard Duvall, composer, and the list goes on almost to 100 people. Um, I think number three needs um, to have a heritage property, property overlay on it, um, and that's all I need to say. That's a brief. I can't say the rest because of time. Well said. Um, <laughs> thanks very much. That was incredibly interesting. Um, and I note, sure? note that we... Um, you know, extraordinary. That if the, every house has got uh, The residents so. of Albert are very passionate about that property. It is very well loved. And I went visited a couple of days ago and it was starting to look really run down. Yeah. So I hope the council will um, have a look at the situation. Thank Thanks you. very much, Robert. Thank you. Lisa Farm. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you to the Mayor and the councillors for the opportunity um, to speak today um, regarding the petition opposing the development 1 to 5 Tony Grove. My name's Lisa Pham um, and I live in 2, two slash 1A Tony Grove, Elwood. Um, I wish to speak on behalf of myself and the other residents who live in the block of community housing flats next door to the proposed development site. We believe that this proposed development has given no sort of consideration to the surrounding environment, the neighbourhood character or the impact it will have on our quality of life. Our residents are vulnerable. A number are elderly, some have health conditions and cannot work and most spend the majority of time at home. And home is our haven. Having finally found stable and affordable housing, we are here in Tyuna Grove for the long term. We're not in a position to be able to up stakes and move out of the street. We believe our amenity and quality of life is as important as any other homeowner or tenant and needs to be protected for our health and wellbeing. Everybody needs access to light, open space, fresh air and restful sleep at night. This development will compromise all of those things for our residents. We will have loss of light, 
We will have overshadowing of our habitable spaces, we'll have traffic congestion in our streets and we will have noise from cars entering the property which will run down to a car park along our fence lines which will be past our bedrooms and living rooms. And just to make it clear, those windows only face onto the development so we'll be looking at this monolithic structure. Um, a number of our residents have medical conditions and I'm concerned that the development will put residents' health and lives at risk if emergency vehicles cannot access the property in a timely manner. A number of the residents do need um, emergency help because of their health. Finally, we can't imagine how stressful it would be to have the upheaval, noise and disruption that a building this size will create next door to us and ongoing for two years. In summary, the development will significantly, significantly affect the health and well-being of some of Port Phillip's most vulnerable residents. We have as much right to a quality of life that supports our health and well-being and we deserve as much consideration by Council as any other resident. I call on the Council to please support the residents of community housing and to continue to oppose this development for our neighbourhood. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> And finally, Simon Martin. Councillors, good evening. Simon Martin from Ratio Consultants here on behalf of the uh, developer McKim of 1 to 5 Tuna. Firstly, and to put on record, we have no objection to the petition hereby submitted to Council tonight. We would, however, state, and again and put on record, that the renders contained in the Change Org petition and the Domain Article of 8th of June are neither a true or accurate representation of the development proposed. Regarding the revised Sorry about that. Thank you. We would further question the substance of the recent 17th of June study commissioned by Peter Andrew Barrett and the conclusions the study finds. We take this opportunity to put on record that the proposed development at 1 to 5 Tuna Grove is not a reason to conduct a knee-jerk or politically motivated heritage review of these controls. This noting the comprehensive and well-researched heritage studies of 2005 and 2018, both concluding that none of these lots are of heritage value. It is on this basis that we respectfully request that the council laws uh, remove or strike out item three of the recommendation put forward tonight. Thank you. Thanks very much, Simon. Councillors, uh, questions of officers or a motion? Councillor Pearl and then Councillor Crawford. Councillor Pearl. For Okay. Councillor Crawford. My question is, I just wanted clarity, please, around the neighbourhood zone as opposed to where we've identified for building up. Does, is that section of Tiana Groove, just for my knowledge before I vote, um, that doesn't allow 
um, that kind of level of, of building? Where does the where is the line? You know, so on Ormond Road we allow greater build up. Then where is the line? What's the difference between the two zones? I guess is what I'm actually asking. Um, along Tiana Grove, um, it's in the, included in the neighbourhood residential zone. The boundary is drawn for those properties that are fronting Ormond Grove. They're actually in the residential growth zone. So the difference being um, there is a mandatory height control in the neighbourhood residential zone and the residential growth zone, there is a discretionary height control. That, that is increased. Yep. Is that the only difference or is there in, in kind of... Um, responding to a, 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 you know, a more residential street as opposed to a growth zone, as, or is that the main difference? Um, there's a number of differences. I mean, the primary purpose of the zones is different. The residential growth zone is primarily to um, achieve a, a higher growth area. Um, the neighbourhood residential zone, besides the height, also has the pur purpose of protecting single dwellings, um, as well it applies the, the mandatory garden area requirements. So it is trying to achieve, um, it is about protecting neighbourhood character. Any further questions, councillors? Councillor Baxter? No, no. Oh. Can I just ask in regards to traffic, um, I know there's been a lot of mention traffic and it is a very narrow street where you have to, it's really only one lane street. When our traffic uh, team look at the traffic advice given, do we have a set of parameters that they have to assess by? Is that state set? Do we have a local law in terms of you know the number of cars that move through that is acceptable or is that set at a state level? Or is it specific to our area? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, the the parking rates are set um, as part of the, uh, set through the planning scheme and applied to residential zones across the municipality. So, uh, the traffic engineers would be assessing the property in relation to those. We do allow reduced rates where um, uh, there is good access to public transport, but I'm not um, I'm not certain of the rates that were applied in this instance. Councillor Baxter? I didn't have a question. I was just happy to move the motion. Oh, the, the, count, uh, the officers uh, amended um, alternative okay. recommendation. Could, um, I just see if we can get that alternative recommendation onto the... Uh, it's quite lengthy, so I, I don't want to ask you to read it out. Just we chuck it on the screen, which is happening now. I could provide a brief overview of what the changes yeah, are, sure. I suppose. But, um, so can I just ask for a seconder? Councillor Crawford, do you wish to second? Oh, so, oh Councillor, sorry. Oh, I think actually David did. So Councillor Brand seconded. Yes. So okay, yes, OK. Um, I, I uh, appreciate the the support of both Councillors Crawford and Brad in, um, uh, in this, and I note that any one of us uh, would have been happy to move this. Um, so uh, the differences uh, between the alternative recommendation uh, that the officers um, have given here and what was uh, put in the papers are that um, number two has been amended to say that um, Council has advised VCAT and all parties and previous objectors today that it does not support the amended proposal shown on the plan substituted on 10th of July 2018. Um, is that date right? Yep. Um, and uh, then there's uh, an item four, uh, which endorses the findings of the heritage advice prepared by Peter Andrew Barrett as the strategic basis for proposing mo modified heritage controls to 357 and 15 Toyota Grove. Um, and urgently request the Minister for Planning to prepare and approve an amendment to the Port Phillip Planning Scheme uh, pursuant to the sections of the Act to extend Heritage Overlay 8 on an interim basis to apply to the aforementioned properties um, that whilst permanent controls are progressed um, and 6 authorises the CEO or delegate to seek ministerial authorisation to prepare and exhibit Amendment C174 to the Port Phillip Planning Scheme pursuant to the relevant section of the Planning Environment Act uh, to apply heritage controls to those properties on a permanent basis. And the amendment would comprise 
um, the specific changes to the Port Phillip planning scheme that are listed there. I won't go through every single one of them, but it's about um, upgrading the, uh, the heritage uh, citations um, on these properties. I hope that without having to read out the entire thing, that gives a, a No, no, that, a that's fine. Um, it's been seconded. <clears throat> Is there anything else you want to say? And, uh, oh, and it's just also that um, the council gives written notice to the private building surveyor um, that, that, uh, that a request has been made to the Minister for Planning to prepare a planning scheme amendment. Okay. Is there anything you wish to say in addition to that? Uh, yes, you don't I, have to. No, no. I'll, well, I'll just I'll briefly thank all the all the uh, petitioners and the people that have been uh, really, really active uh, on this uh, issue. So um, obviously, I've I've spoken to uh, a few people, and some people um, uh, have, you know, been active and have spoken to other councillors. I think um, uh, people have spoken to a lot of people, but uh, this is. Uh, obviously a big issue in the area. Um, uh, we supported uh, the, the officer's recommendation to refuse um, this uh, application and have been working through this process and trying to figure out exactly what we need to do going forward in terms of what the heritage uh, stuff looks like, what the planning application looks like and, and how a, 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 an application to demolish is technically separate to to the application to build something, but um, in some ways needs to be considered at the same uh, time, um, uh, and particularly when you're talking about replacing a heritage uh, building that may be contributory or, or whatever. So um, it's been hard work behind the scenes, and I want to commend the officers for the work that they've done, both at VCAT and uh, in doing the, the hard yards of the work and the heritage work um, to get us to the point where we can now um, fairly confidently say that we're going to pursue this uh, course of action. We can't guarantee any particular outcome. We're requesting something from the Minister, but this is where we're at at the moment, and I think it's a pretty uh, good place that we've landed. So thanks to everybody involved, and let's see how we go. Councillor Brand. Thank you very much. Um, would uh, in endorse the words of Councillor Baxter there. It's been a pretty amazing um, community... Uh, campaign, really more than a campaign. It's been a sort of a, um, a coming together of, of a lot of people in the community with a, with, a, with a broad view of the value of the built environment of that, uh, that part of Elwood. And this, is, this case is a, a really, I suppose, a sort of a, um, a central example of the sort of thing that they are very, very keen to um, uh, articulate and to fight. And, and they've done an amazing job with that uh, petition, not just the petition, but the detail that they've gone into, the understanding of the planning scheme, um, the understanding of the community. It has been quite um, impressive to be a bit of a spectator on, and I certainly congratulate them on doing that. I, I just think it's a really important thing to do. I think the, the decision about the development is, is going to be made in VCAT, um, uh, I, I'm, it's, not, it's not for us right now to say what we think the right decision is, but there's obviously doubt about the heritage status of those buildings, and when it comes down to heritage, you can't... If you have a, if you, if you have a doubt about it, you actually have to act to preserve something because you can't bring it back once it's gone, and it would be an absolutely tragic and... and unacceptable outcome that a proposal for that site would go to VCAT, <coughs> um, not to, with, a, with, with a, 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 every chance of being refused by VCAT, and in the meantime the buildings there have been demolished. And I think that was the first cab off the rank of things that need to be dealt, by, dealt with uh, with this motion, is at least to keep the buildings intact let the process run, but do not preempt it, and do not end up with a disaster like we've had in other places in this city, of sites sitting there with with no heritage building on the site or no valued building on the site, and no proposal as well. So we're certainly hoping to have averted that, and hoping for um, uh, even better results for the community uh, as we proceed. But thank you all for coming, and thank you all for doing all that work. Thank you, Councillor Brand. Are there any other speakers? Oh, 
Sorry, I almost missed you, Councillor Bond. Um, overdevelopment in our suburbs, well, it's, I think we're all um, getting sick and tired of it. And I thought I'd take the opportunity, because we've got a lot of people in the gallery who uh, may not have been to a council meeting before, but to give you a little bit of a history lesson. If you want to know why we're getting smashed in our, our suburbs with overdevelopment, go all the way back to the council meeting of the 26th of August in 2014, Item 8.1, titled New Residential Zone Stage 2. Uh, that was a proposal that came to the City of Port Phillip, this, this council chamber. Um, and during that meeting, uh, six councillors, I wasn't one of them, I was the only councillor to vote against these. The following streets were changed from neighbourhood residential zone to residential growth zone, which is from the, the lowest density area to the middle density area. Grey Street, Princess Street, Hotham Street, Ormond Road, Barclay Street, Marine Parade, Glen Huntley Road, St Kilda Street, Inkerman Street and Alma Road. And the following streets and areas were changed from the uh, residential growth, uh, the general residential zone to the residential growth zone, which is from the medium area to the highest density area, Beacon Cove, Ormond Road in Elwood, Beaconsfield Parade and Port Melbourne High Rise area. This was done not at the, the request of officers, but it was done at the request of the and I'll name them the Cap and Unchained councillors who sat in this chamber at that particular time for reasons known only to themselves. And the reason it's important because we've got all these large developments going up on all our main arterial feeder roads, and now that they've been maxed out or close to being maxed out, that, that development is spreading into our residential streets such as this one where a three-storey pr proposal doesn't seem so big when you compare it to the... the the six-storey one that's been built next door. But if that six-storey one had never been allowed to be built in the first place, the three-storey ones you see creeping their way through our residential streets, there's no way we'd ever allow them to happen. So if you want to read about it yourselves, it's the Council Minutes from the 26th of August 2014, item 8.1, and you can see exactly which councillors have imposed this upon our community and the community groups they represent. So I will be supporting the motion. Great outcome, um, but I think it's important our residents know the history of why we're getting smashed like this. Thanks very much. Councillor Bond. Um, okay, uh, do you wish to close, Councillor Baxter? I'll just, I, there was one thing I wanted to say that I forgot to say the first time around, so I'll say it now. Good um, point. But uh, I remember when, when we were talking about a, a similar um, interim uh, controls that we were trying to get for a uh, property that was in South Melbourne, um, and I... Uh, I'm, I'm big noting myself here, but I had a great quote at the time that I'm going to say again, is that the free market is always going to be able to create more apartments, it's not going to be able to create much more heritage buildings, and that's kind of our job. So that's what we're doing here, and I'm very glad to see that we've actually been able to do that. There are plenty of times when we haven't been able to protect those, and it's really good to see. <laughs> okay, um, it's been moved and seconded. Speeches have been one and one. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thanks very much. Agenda item five is the sealing schedule. Councillors, we have no documents that require sealing. sealing. Six, public question times. Councillors, we have one member of the public who's requested to uh, ask a question tonight. Um, Jen Edge. Jen, could you please excuse me, um, state your name and suburb for the record? Jen? Jen Edge, St Kilda. Uh, I've asked uh, questions in relation to these matters here uh, over the last three years and some of them even beyond that, so just banging this drum again. I refer to previous questions here over at least three years regarding one, the restoration of footpaths, specifically Inkerman and St Kilda Road, 
uh, St Kilda Road and Argyle Street, those issues are over 12 years now. Uh, Marriott Street, along with uh, pigeons roost and dropping issues in Bath Street, corner of Inkerman. When will these be fully remedied? And number two, the restoration of the children's play equipment in the Rotary Children's Park on Jacka Boulevard. When will these be restored and in place, please? That's been three years I've been asking on that one. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Um, is there any officers who can enlighten us on this one? Sorry, are there any officers? Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, we'll take the um, first component of those questions on notice, but the second one in relation to uh, Rotary Park, um, that's being considered as part of Council's budget tonight and subject to uh, Council approving the budget, uh, then um, we would be finalising a concept design, undertaking some consultation and looking to start the construction uh, following um, the summer. Thanks very much, Ms Blair. Thanks, Jen. Okay. Council question time. Councillors, are there any questions for officers? Councillor Pearl. Thanks, Mayor. My question relates to the um, documents that have been uploaded for this council meeting on our website, in particular uh, the large budget doc doc document under uh, item 14.2. It's a very lengthy document at 289 pages. The format in which these documents have been uploaded um, seems to be an image format and means those documents of the PDFs can't be searched by word. Um, this council prides itself on transparency and accountability uh, and such an important document to be in some respects inaccessible uh, to be searched for key terms such as uh, budget or a certain project or community group that someone's looking for uh, makes it less accessible for people in our community to read the document and the parts are important to them. Just wondering if we could uh, get comment on um, how this occurred and how we can prevent this from happening in the future. Officers? Through, through you, Mr Mayor, I need to take some advice around how, uh, how it happened, um, but we can certainly look into that as a process improvement for future in terms of large documents. Thanks very much, and thanks for your question. Any further questions? I now um, move to presentation reports. Um, so, uh, sorry, I'll just get my act together. <clears throat> Sure. Just to add to the last question, uh, through you, Mr Mayor, uh, all council documents are in PDF format and a decent PDF reader such as Zoda has a search option on it where you can search words like budget and find that in the PDF document. That's for your information, Councillor Paul. Thanks for that. I'm in the Adobe uh, official reader, which is the official software, and that doesn't support, so I think Adobe would probably have a bigger take up in our community than... Um, than a niche PDF reader. Okay. Thanks very much for that, Mr CEO. Um, 9.1, commercial recreation policy. Council says no questions from the community on this. Do you have any questions? If there are no questions, can I call for a resolution? Councillor Copsey? Happy to move the officer's recommendation. Uh, do I have a seconder? Uh, thanks, Councillor Simic. Do you wish to speak, Councillor Copsey? Councillor Simic? Speakers against? All in favour? Move to the vote. Do you, oh, all, all those in favour? That's carried unanimously. 12.1, uh, the rather um, deliciously entitled 12A Beaconsfield Parade, Albert Park, a potential new life for Kiosk 7. 
Sorry? So have I read the wrong... Uh, sorry? Oh, sorry. 129A. Sorry. So, once again, councillors, there's no uh, contribution from the community being required. Are there any questions? If there are no questions, are there any resolutions? Moved, Councillor Bond. Seconded, Councillor Crawford. Councillor Bond, do you wish to speak? It's clearly the night for history lessons. Uh, Twelve months ago, we had a... This kiosk was tenanted. Um, we had someone in there who, who wanted a lease to be renewed from us. Um, we Is as this a, going to be relevant to tonight? It's going to be very relevant to this particular property, Councillor Gross. Okay. Uh, Twelve months ago, we had a, a tenant in this particular property who wanted a lease for this particular property and would have gladly accepted one from us. In return, he was going to rebuild the entire building, whatever it is we agreed that it would happen on the site, um, and would have paid for it all himself. Uh, for some reason, councillors decided to explore other um, opportunities for this particular site, and we did that, spending I don't know how much money to look at whatever we were going to do down there. Yet here we're back now trying to find a tenant. Um, the previous tenant would have done it all. Unfortunately, his business collapsed when we, we failed to give him that lease extension because after that particular July council meeting, he was given, um, went back to his business and he had no certainty beyond the end of the November expiry for his lease. His manager resigned to go and get a job somewhere else. His chef resigned to go and get a job somewhere else and he was forced to shut the business. And I understand this, this report the officers have prepared to us says he was offered a one-year lease extension and chose not to take it. Um, that is correct, but we sort of leave out the bit where his you know, business collapsed because of actions of this particular council um, by not offering him a lease extension. Um, and he was in no position to take up that lease. So here we are now trying to find someone who will do all the same work that we had someone who was prepared to do for us. Um, I don't know how much money we spent doing that and how much we're going to spend doing this um, process, but yeah, this is one of the probably one of the worst decisions this council's ever made, yet here we are trying to get this. So I'll support it, but you know, we need to be a lot more uh, conscious of how we treat some of the businesses who, who operate in our public buildings. Um, they are human beings and... Yeah, and there's also a financial impact for this particular council as a result of that decision. Thanks very much, Councillor Bond. Councillor Crawford, do you wish to speak? Sure. So although he was, uh, the pre previous tenant was a great tenant, um, and I obviously would have been happy for him to continue, there was a reality check on what he needed to do in order to continue his business was to expand the footprint and go up. So there were a lot of other issues. It wasn't just about uh, an extension of lease. It was about whether we would allow a much greater structure and continuing on. So there were other finer nuanced details. I don't doubt that it would have been great to, for him to continue, but let's not rewrite hit history without the nuances, because it's always about the nuances. Um, but I am happy to support this, because it would be great in the meantime, while we figure out this building that is coming towards its asset end, uh, to look to new tenancies and to look to what we do and how we rectify the building as, as needed um, in the, well, not so recent fu new, near future. But I am happy to look for that new tenant, um, and perhaps a more realistic um, envisaging of what can take place, especially with the Shrine to the Sea coming this way. Um, there's a lot of money focusing on that spot and perhaps it's a blessing in disguise that that property may be free to be, I don't know, a more interesting or a better outcome in the long run. Um, Councillor um, Pearl. Just quickly, I, this is a very... Um, recent building and the houses across the road, as I said before, are well over 100 years old, so I'm surprised Council couldn't construct a, a, a structure back in the 90s that's lasted longer than this one has. So that was the first tragedy in some respects, and I hope the next structure is um, built ready, albeit in a challenging place, to last a, 100 years of service. I think we treated the last... I've gone over this many times, but the last business was unfairly treated... Um, 
in the perpetuity of time that we took to get back to him. And I, I hope that we've made the subsequent improvements to our policies and procedures so we don't do this again. It's a price location, that, that is true, but it's a very difficult place also to run a business, uh, particularly during the, the cold winter months that we're currently in. I think, unfortunately, we've ended up uh, over baking this process, but I, I support this motion here this evening to see if we can get a uh, longer living um, structure here. Uh, a proposal was unofficially provided, I think, by the previous tenant uh, to uh, build a different um, structure there in terms of uh, attached to a lease, uh, but that was never really formally considered by this council in this council chamber at all. And by the time we did have notice of it and start considering it, it was far too late. Uh, business deals on certainty and you can't um, provide certainty to a business operator in a 12 month time frame on this sort of site and that sort of industry. So it's a tragedy which I hope we can now put behind us and hopefully we can get a new lease of life on this site. It's also interesting to note that extensive renovations have happened to the building next door, uh, the Angling Club, of which we didn't require any of this sort of uh, investigation or master plan type investigation, nor on the uh, building on the more historic building, I would say, on the Kerford Road side. I'm happy to support this motion tonight. Councillor Baxter. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I, I, I do feel that there's, there's been some mistruths thrown about and I, 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 do, I, I, I can't fathom why some councillors have decided to use this motion um, to grandstand and, and throw away around things that aren't true. Um, the fact is that we will often, as a council, we will have tenancies with businesses. Those businesses sometimes present to us unsolicited um, uh, options for what they would like to do with the property that they're leasing from us. Sometimes those are great ideas. Sometimes we go, we don't, we don't really like that idea, maybe come back with something else. Most of them will be happy to work with us on those proposals. Some are less happy to, to work with us on those proposals and sometimes uh, we, we, we're unable to, to see eye to eye. Um, we made every effort to work with this tenant, uh, giving them extensions and, and giving them extensive feedback about what we'd like to see um, there. Uh, well, we did, we did offer an, a, a lease extension. It's written right there. Close, close. Um, we'll have a time. So I think this is probably more about two councillors wanting to uh, make a name for themselves than act the actual realities of it. Councillor Baxter, I, please, really like, please keep to the... Uh, and yet I can be interrupted by the councillors. Okay. Um, so what, I, what I'd really like to see here is um, a good um, a strategic process like this, which is a tenant which can go out to see what the possibilities are with this, rather than being constrained by one uh, tenant's sort of vision that they weren't really preparing, uh, planning to, to budge from. Uh, and that this will give us a lot of options as to what we can look at. And so that's why I will endorse this motion. Councillor Simich. This location is a public asset and I think we owe it... Uh, we, we, we have the responsibility to make sure that we uh, look at every option, every possibility um, for such an important site uh, in our municipality to uh, be and live to its fullest potential. So I think that, um, well, firstly, I want to thank the officers for the process that they've taken uh, bringing us to this point. Um, it has been a, a thorough process and there's been uh, a lot of negotiation that's taken up um, a lot of uh, officer time. Um, but I think we've come to a point where um, we do have some very good steps set up. Um, I really just wanted to use this opportunity to, to thank the officers for all the work that they've done. Um, and to point out that we do really have to make sure that we take decisions like this very seriously um, and we do explore uh, every option, uh, making sure uh, that we are very clear in our communication about what, what we're working towards, and I think we have been. So um, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, officers. Um, look, uh, if there's no further speakers, I might just say a few words. Um, I'm a bit scarred by this site because uh, I... <laughs> It is my fault. Um, so going back to around, uh, I think, the late 1990s, 2000, there was a proposal to put on this site a um, really dramatic structure. 
really dramatic structure with quite a, a, a beautiful roof form. And um, of course, the outrage was palpable. The, um, all of the arguments that we were elicited in the arguments about Tyuna Grove were um, trotted out. So we capitulated and built the fairly mediocre building that we have now. And so, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm scarred by this building, but I sort of understand that, you know, the foreshore is incredibly contested space. It's very difficult to make quick decisions on the foreshore without extensive consultation, heritage reports. That is a very precious part of the heritage fabric of Port Phillip there. So I always approach this particular decision with the uh, former um, lessee with trepidation because I know it's such a contested, complicated, difficult space. So I, I sense that there are things that I regret about what happened recently, but there are things that I think are inevitable with a building such as this, positioned right in front of the vista that everyone enjoys. So maybe we can learn from what happened, but maybe we just have to take into account the fact that councillors are always going to be very hesitant about quickly making decisions on this site. So we've got a process now and let's try and move on from the history and I commend the uh, officers rec to you. So I'll move, go to the move. Do you wish to close? <laughs> Get um, your loins, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to correct Councillor Baxter. It wasn't an unsolicited proposal. We wrote to him and requested he send us a proposal where he builds toilets inside his cafe. Point of order, Mayor. On what basis, Councillor Simic? Yeah, sorry, what's the point of order? I, I, I don't believe that this is relevant to the actual recommendation. Uh, Look, I think hand. most of the conversation tonight has not been relevant to tonight's conversation, relevant. but we're, 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 we're embarked on that yeah. process and I think the move is entitled to contest some of the statements that were made about his narrative, whether we think it's right or wrong. He's allowed to, in closing, say he thinks it's wrong. Thank you, Mayor, and I shall continue before I was where I was before I was interrupted. Um, it wasn't an unsolicited proposal. We requested he send us a proposal which included toilets. Um, I think the debate was whether the toilets were on the inside, which he felt would unfairly impact his business, um, and he sent us a proposal that had toilets on the outside, and that was the only extension to his building. So it wasn't like he was trying to go up, out, anything else. The only change to the current footprint was a couple of toilets um, that we insisted had to go into this proposal in order, order for him to be compliant with our own um, health acts. Um, it got to the point where he was chasing a lease and he couldn't, and planning permits, he couldn't get a planning permit for what he wanted to do because he didn't have a lease and he couldn't get a lease because he didn't have a planning for, permit. So it went back and forth for about seven years with those particular um, those particular aspects remaining unresolved until his business eventually went out of business because we decided to explore, or I shouldn't say we, some councillors decided to explore other opportunities. Um, great, that's now behind us. Let's put the, the fact we killed a business behind us, the cost of all that exercise behind us, and move on and hope we get a, a great outcome in this particular location. Thanks very much, Councillor Bond. I'll move to the vote. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thanks very much. Um, 13.1, Cultural Development Fund recommend, Grant Recommendations 2019-20. to 20. There are no um, questions from the community. Um, we do have uh, time and opportunity for council questions. Are there any questions from you, councillors, or do we go straight to motion? Since it's motion time, is it? okay, Cal Councillor Baxter. I'm not actually sure it can be answered because of the confidential nature of dealing with the, the grant applications, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Um, uh, so I note that uh, the, you know, the different categories um, for these grants uh, in different uh, areas of the arts. Did we receive any applications um, that regarding uh, sort of digital arts, 
um, you know, uh, games or, or VR uh, presentations or those sorts of things? Uh, is this an area that you're starting to see more things coming through and they didn't quite make the cut? Uh, through you, Mr Mayor. Um, we are um, endeavouring to attract more of those types of applications to the fund. There weren't any this year. We um, promoted it amongst uh, our network of um, game developers and, and artists and creatives in that area, and we'll continue to do so. Thank you. Good question. Well answered, I thought. Do we have a resolution? Can I... Councillor Crawford. Councillor Gross, seconding. Um, Councillor Crawford. So I was lucky enough to be the chair of the committee, although that can be a difficult job when there are so many amazing applications. Um, but I have to say that thank you to uh, our various members of our community who sat on the panel. Um, their knowledge and insight, especially to find detail, was so helpful and it actually made the process very easy. It was really clear by using their expertise which projects we should fund this year. But there are always more projects than we have the money to fund and um, I would like to encourage artists to continue to apply. We have increased the funding for the first time, or it happened last year, um, but we are very proud to support the various people uh, and their projects because this is a city that has always focused on the arts and it is becoming harder in a time of gentrification but we still value our artists and we just as a council are really supportive and want to encourage creatives to stay in the city and work in the city because that's what is part of our heart and soul. I, I don't wish to speak. Does anyone else wish to speak? I'll move to the vote then. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Councillors, I, I want to move to um, the council plan, item 14.2, because we've got some people languishing in the, uh, um, in the uh, You've got, you got a speaker here. Oh, sorry, I made a mistake. I've got David Blakely. Okay, 13.2. Uh, sorry about that. I, I, I neglected to see that we actually do have a uh, speaker. Fit, on Fitzroy Street Placemaking, Renew Scoping Study. First, David Blakely. Before 14.2, yeah. I can't see him. So, uh, councillors, are there any questions? Councillor Pearl? Uh, I think so. The, the obviously, placemaking is in the title. Under the budget, I think it's 150000 over two years, 75000 in the one year. How much have we spent in placemaking on Fitzroy Street to date? Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, in this year's council uh, budget, council allocated $300,000 for the placemaking initiative that is across three of the placemaking areas. Um, we haven't fully expended that budget this year uh, because uh, it has taken us some time uh, working with the community to uh, source ideas and initiatives with them. I don't have the specific detail here in front of me um, in terms of what we've spent um, specific to Fitzroy Street as opposed to uh, South Melbourne um, and other parts, but I could certainly provide that, but I don't have that here today. Any further questions? Motions? Moved Councillor Copsey, seconded Councillor Bond. Do you wish to speak, Councillor Copsey? Reserve. Councillor Bond? Um, yes, thank you, Councillor Gross. Um, this, is, this will be money well spent for Fitzroy Street. I think it's uh, no secret that we've got a few problems down there and it's a street that is struggling a touch, but I'm, you know, I've been optimistic for many, many years about Fitzroy Street <laughs> and I still remain so. Uh, you know, we've got the Pride Centre currently under construction. When that's up and running, we'll have a couple of hundred people working on Fitzroy Street, which will give it a daytime economy. You know, Rabata, we all thought that was going to close. It's, they've been given a reprieve. They've able to, been able to renegotiate 
um, a better yes, they're not closing now. They had a, actually had a closing down party. And then the following day, <laughs> and it's a little bit awkward. Um, <laughs> it, it was a little bit like that. I sort of ran into them on a Monday and they just walked out of a meeting where they'd been given a reprieve. So they're still going, just holding on, but it's great to have Rabada there. We've got a Scottish bar going in uh, where the old Barney Allens used to be. We've got a Sri Lankan restaurant about to open up where the French place used to be. And I'm told the old bookshop's been rented for a bar as well. So there are, there are slowly... Sorry? The rain room at the Prince of Wales, which is that big construction above uh, Laos Kitchen. So there's all lots of really good things happening there. We just, as an organisation, just need to you know, get this street through the next couple of, couple of months over winter. Um, we'll get back into summer and some of these initiatives where, where funding will hopefully kick in and we can fill a few of the other vacant tenancies down there with a few of this. I went along there this morning and you know, there wasn't a single rough sleeper down there at 10 o'clock this morning when I went and got a haircut, which is the first time in a, I don't know, it'd be six or 12 months that I have walked along there and not seen a single person sleeping on the street. So you know, it's, there are still problems around there. I've witnessed one drug deal, but that's less than what I normally see down there. Um, but you know, got a few, couple of issues, but hopefully we're coming out the other side and be a little bit more positive about this street. And this is one of the one of the activities that Council's doing, one of the areas we can influence down there where we can make a difference, and this will hopefully fill a few of those vacant tenancies. So commend the, the money, and uh, while it is a lot of money, $150,000, I think it's money well spent. So we'll be supporting it. Good on you, Councillor Bond. Councillor Pearl. Thanks very much. This is a sizeable investment, but the thing that put me across the line is the attached report. Uh, the new, new Fitzroy Street scoping study, and particularly um, the responses to high visible vacancies councillors and also the success criteria that would be applied. I, I think this is, this is reasonably good money. Uh, I voted against the placemaking uh, program because I felt that was good money after bad, uh, and I, don't, I didn't think that was going to be successful in Fitzroy Street, and I still don't think it will be. I think that sort of program will get much more bang for buck in South Melbourne, uh, which, which needs it and deserves it. At the, uh, you know, those areas have suffered great, a great deal at the cost of St Kilda over the decades. That gets a large amount of resources and a large amount of attention. I think this program provides value for money, which is why I'm happy to support it. But um, you know, going forward, we, we're going to have to have a good hard look at ourselves if this doesn't actually deliver any value. And I'll be interested to see the results of it going forward. But I uh, wish the um, program all the very best. I'm looking forward to seeing the results. And I hope that placemaking money uh, can now be diverted out of Fitzroy Street and moved to um, South Melbourne and Port Melbourne. Thank you. I just noticed Mr Blakely walked in. Um, you've missed your opportunity, I'm afraid, David. Is there anything in very, very abbreviated form that you need to say? Because I think it's... Yes. Thank you. Um, as we know, Victoria Street's got over 30 vacancies at the moment. Uh, so the greatest um, asset for the community. I think with this endorsing this program, Renew Australia, um, along with improved safety, with improved um, amenity on the street, and also the Pride Centre, will help turn, remove, return an asset to the community. Um, and, as it's, as, and as Councillor Pearl said, there's other areas in the city of Port Phillip under trouble too. So this is it's probably the hardest nut to crack. Um, let's try and get this one up and going, then look at other areas in, this, in the area. I know it's part of local government to um, maintain you know, economic assets, so it's very depraved at the moment. So any help would be great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, David. Count, Councillor Baxter? Uh, yeah, so uh, I'll be supporting the motion um, that there's, you know, I've, I've read a lot in newspapers and stuff recently about, you know, the decline of high streets and, and you know, what, what can we mm. do about those things and the decline of retail. It is making it really, really difficult for these strips um, and it means that, uh, you know, they often turn into uh, contested spaces um, that, rather than inclusive spaces uh, and I'm 
very big on having Fitzroy Street be an inclusive space. Um, so uh, I, don't, I don't think necessarily the absence of rough sleepers is, is a metric that we should be using to measure how successful the space is. I think how well we care for those people is the better metric. But I'm very glad to see um, the idea that we will be uh, looking at filling some of, uh, some of these uh, vacancies uh, with some creative tendencies um, and the idea that we can uh, bring life uh, to an area through art and creativity I think is personally very gratifying to me. And, uh, and as someone who, uh, who spent six years working uh, on this street uh, in another life, uh, back when it was a very different street, um, it will be interesting to see what the next iteration of Fitzroy Street will look like. And I think this will uh, be part of that. Thanks very much. Councillor Simic. Yes, uh, Mayor, I'll also be supporting this proposal tonight, noting that um, this is something that has come out and grown out of the placemaking project, um, which uh, I also supported when it was presented to Council. Um, it's been really important for us to engage with the community uh, not just on Fitzroy Street but in other parts of our municipality to understand the specific issues uh, in that area. I've long thought that working with property owners uh, is an important uh, aspect that we've struggled with uh, in the past. Uh, I note that this program does that um, and a as a result I'm really hopeful that uh, with that collaboration of traders, property owners, uh, property managers, agents and, and others that we can see um, good outcomes for uh, Fitzroy Street um, and if this works um, hopefully it can be a program that we uh, also um, uh, put in place in other parts of our municipality um, and being a councillor for the Gateway Ward um, some, some of our retail strips also uh, need uh, support um, from council um, but through the placemaking process um, I feel like we are moving in that direction in, in that area too. So I commend this proposal. Thanks. Councillor Brand? Yes, I share Councillor Bond's optimism about Fitzroy Street um, into the future, and I uh, agree with um, Councillor Simic's point that it is absolutely essential that we deal with um, uh, and collaborate with uh, property owners in the street. Uh, the most important thing for me long term uh, in Fitzroy Street is that ultimately we need a far better offering to the public, a more, a more varied and a more um, quality sort of offering than, than, than what we've had, and one which first of all serves the local community um, and caters to its needs and tastes, uh, upon which, if, and if we could achieve that, we would also be achieving um, a fantastic um, tourist experience too because tourists would be coming to see what real life in St Kilda was rather than other tourists looking for life. Um, so there's, there's, there's a really, I think, vibrant, fantastic, economically sustainable, well, economically incredibly productive um, future sitting there, uh, de depending very, very much on the decisions that landowners and, and business owners make about what is offered to the public. At the moment, we've got all of the... We've got, as, as David said, the uh, 30 vacancies. It is bleak, it is, it is empty, and somehow we've got to bridge that gap. I think it's about making great decisions and, and consulting everybody deeply about a long-term future rather than reacting to the short. But the Renew Australia uh, process builds a bridge between those two things. It actually takes empty space and fills it. And it does it in a very, very clever way, which, well, there are many clever things about the way it does it, including just the simple um, idea that what gets put into, what the, the temporary tenants, that, the temporary occupants that are found for these, uh, for these spaces and agreed to by the landlords um, do not compete with the other with, with the other businesses in the street. They complement them by offering something different rather than more of the same. And that simple gesture by itself is enough to perhaps um, generate a sense of what else St Fitzroy Street could be, what else it can offer, what else might be able to sort of take root in a, in a, in a, in a, in a different environment. Um, unfortunately, it's the tourist-orientated things that 
make more money than the local economy oriented things went in a boom and in a bust uh, there's nothing for the locals and there's nothing for the tourists and so it's just a matter of finding uh, an alternative mix a better deeper richer mix uh, for the street to grip hold of and and uh, grow and flourish into and um, the renew Australia process is a vital part of that and a clever part and I'm looking forward to seeing it work Good on you. Okay. Do you wish to close? Councillor Copsey? Yes, I'm closing. Thanks. Um, I can't add much. That's been very comprehensive. Thank you, councillors. It's good to see a lot of support for this um, exciting project. I do note that it's contingent, so we're authorising tonight the um, CEO to negotiate partnership in order to del deliver this. Um, and so I really hope that we're successful in doing that and wish the CEO the best with those negotiations. There's a lot of promise for, um, from the Renew Fitzroy Street uh, um, feasibility and we're really excited, I think, to see this come back and to see it take to the next step. Um, thanks very much to everyone who's engaging in the placemaking process as well. Um, these ideas coming out through community and partnerships are exactly what... We've sometimes missed, I think, in the past in our attempts to um, deal with this, so I'm really pleased to see um, that we'll have, as well as Council, some other partners working on delivering really exciting, I hope, outcomes um, to fill some of those vacancies in a creative way. All the best, Mr CEO, and to the Fitzroy um, Street Business Association with taking this forward. Great. We move to the vote. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Um, thanks very much. 14.1 um, is so we're, get, we're getting into the um, into the budget items now. As I said, we had a special uh, special meeting on the budget and took almost two hours or over two hours of uh, submissions. Then, so I'm going to be uh, quite ruthless and. Uh, limit it to one and could people not repeat what they've heard before even if they really really agree with it. So uh, 14, having said that 14.1 return of the 2019 general valuation there are actually no speakers for this one so councillors do you have any questions? Do we have any uh, resolutions? Um, Councillor Bond and Councillor Copsey Council, move Councillor Bond, seconded Councillor Copsey. Uh, Councillor Bond, do you wish to speak? Councillor Copsey? Um, does anyone else wish to speak? Move to the vote. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Um, 14.2. Council plan 2017 to 27 and budget 2019-20. Adoption. And I'll note there's an alt alternative recommendation and, uh, and motions. But uh, let's start with um, the speakers from the, um, from the uh, uh, general public. Uh, Lindsay, Lindsay Gordon. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Lindsay Gordon from Port Melbourne. Uh, I want to speak about the, uh, the rate cap. Uh, just to recap, so that in case those don't, who don't know, the rate cap's chosen by the Minister for Local Government on the advice of the Essential Services Commission, that's the ESC. Um, when the Essential Services Commission was requested to make the uh, recommendation of the government, that was in November 19, uh, 2018, and at that stage, the, it, it, has, it has a particular formula, and one of the items in the formula is the CPI. And at that stage, the uh, ESC was clearly waiting and wanting to have the CPI figure that was not yet out, but was due out in December. And they sort of complained in their letter to the government that, uh, and they seemed to be quite constrained by this fact and they had to rely on the uh, CPI figure forecast by the finance department 
in May that year, and the CPI figure in May uh, was for, was two point forecast CPI figure was two point five percent. And the long and the short of it was that the Minister for Local Government got the recommendation from the ESC for a rate cap maximum of 2.58, but decided on a, a rate cap of 2.5. Now, the thing is that the current inflation rate has dropped to 1.3. It's about 1% less. So I put it to the council that is perfectly open. You don't have to go the whole hog. This is a top figure the 2.5 per cent, you can't charge more. Go, you don't have to just take the money and spend it. I'll call it out as price gouging. And you could decide to have a current inflation rate of 1.3 per cent, and that's knock 1 per cent off the budget and get the Thanks, officers Lindsay. to find the savings. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Bruce Armstrong. Uh, Bruce Armstrong, Albert Park, um, and also ratepayers of Port Phillip. I'm carrying my comprehensive income statement again, which I gave you at our budget meeting. And um, I'm reminding, I want to remind the people of the public that we have a um, $300 million business in 10 years and a $200 and $26 million business this year, and it's significant numbers. And I would just like to ask, in the, in the budget uh, finances and, and uh, preparation, it says there will be a direct decrease of seven full-time employees. Rates will rise rough plus or minus to four, uh, another 4.074 million, of which 2.5 will go to employee costs, that's about 62% of the rates in, of the rate increases will go to employee costs. My question is, what is driving that level of um, increase going to salaries? Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Bruce. Sorry, I'm just making a note. Um, Rhonda Clark. Hi. Hi. Rhonda Clark. I'm from Alwood and I'm also uh, representing the ratepayers of Port Phillip Incorporated who have over 600 members. Um, the ROP supports the, uh, a number of the council's sustainability initiatives such as flood water adaptation and waste management programs such as waste reduction and diversions from landfill. However, we question a number of the funding initiatives um, and the following ones I'll outline. We applaud the work of the Eco Centre and what it's doing to educate schools and the community on waste management and environmental protection. But we question the merit of increasing the Council's funding for the Eco Centre to 408,000 from the current 228,000. This represents an increase of 179,000 per annum. We heard on June the 4th from a council officer that the Eco Centre receives additional funding from the City of Port Phillip, bringing the total to more than 301,000. Additional funding that includes things such as 40,000 for school programs, 58,000 for consulting services and subsidised rentals. It's not possible to reconcile the amounts in the budget and we are concerned that the total funding for the Eco Centre could exceed more than 500,000 when additional payments are included. We're surprised to learn from the Eco Centre CEO in a statement to this council on June the 4th that the centre intends to reduce the provision of services to schools in the city of Port Phillip if the funding increase was not granted. The council was told that without additional funding, the centre could only provide a service to nine out of the 19 schools in Port Phillip. Uh, this is quite confusing when the council is currently paying more than 300,000 for these services. We also learnt that of the 19,000 people who participated in the Eco Centre program, 50% of the people were not from the city of Port Phillip and the other 50% come from other areas. 
It is clear that the Eco Centre is a resource for all of Melbourne and not just for Port Phillip, and perhaps the Eco Centre should redirect their funding to customers who live outside of the city. We believe the current level of funding is generous and object to the requested funding increase of 179000 The Eco Centre needs to be weaned off Council's handouts and develop other sources of revenue from customers outside of Port Phillip. The draft budget has allocated $2.8 million for the Eco Centre redevelopment, but this amount was contingent on the election promise from the ALP, and we believe that if they were elected to government and following the election, we expect the $2.8 million to be treated as a saving in the budget and the dividend passed to the ratepayers. Furthermore, on the question of the business case for the solar installation at South Melbourne Market of $770,000, um, we question this when the City of Port Phillip is committed to purchase 100 per cent of renewable uh, electricity. ROP understands that the Council has signed a contract with Melbourne Renewable Energy Program to purchase 100 per cent of renewable electricity from a wind farm near Ararat from 2019-2020. We also question the installation of electronic vehicle charging stations at a cost of 240000 and cannot be justified because there are very few electric vehicles and there are only 10 electric vehicles purchased in 10,000 vehicles purchased last year. It is not the responsibility of local government to waste ratepayers' funds on projects like charging stations. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thanks very much, Rhonda. April Seymour. So we're supposed to limit to one minute, but I've obviously been indulgent. I'll give you one minute per 29,000 users that we have. That's, that's three minutes. No, I'll try to be brief, actually. Um, direction one of the council plan, I'm April Seymour. I'm a resident of East St. Kilda, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Eco Center tonight. Direction one of your council plan is a safe and active community with strong social connections. You have now received budget submissions or direct emails from over 85 locals testifying how the Eco Center embodies Direction One while simultaneously inspiring sustainability knowledge and practical changes in their own lives, schools, and businesses. Yes, for the first time since 2004, we asked for a funding increase. The draft budget responded with a $50,000 decrease against this current year's funding. We asked for corrected funding of 408,000 per year prorated to the costs related to City of Port Phillip users because we do raise $3 for every $1 for you through diverse income streams for those other 50% of users. So the funding we're asking for includes base funding plus education so that we can be open seven days per week to meet the community demand. Alongside this, you'll be getting the proven by your own independent report, $14 economic impact for every $1 invested. You'll be advancing directions one and three and be supporting community requests while covering the true costs, in, as in any business that have increased since 2004 in our original funding agreement. There are core costs that any organization has to demonstrate its financial systems, HR compliance, and various practicalities that must exist as a foundation to secure the fee-for-service work or to assure donors and grant makers of the credibility, capability, and accountability of the organization. Since 2005, Eco Center volunteer hours we contribute have grown 6.6 fold. Program participation has gone up 7.6 fold. Youth choosing to get engaged with us, asking for support outside of schools has increased 500 fold. The population of Port Phillip has gone up 34%. The rate income of Port Phillip has gone up 118%. The cost of employing our executive according to the award legislation has gone up 60%. Meanwhile, since 2005, Council's funding for the Eco Center has gone up 23%. Tonight, councillors, you determine our funding level for the next five years. Please support staying accessible to the Port Phillip community and the costs related to your services. Elizabeth Fenwick. I'm Elizabeth Fenwick. I, I've been resident in Elwood and business owner for more than 30 years, and I'm the acting president of the Committee of Management at the Eco Centre, so I'm speaking on behalf of the Eco Centre. A 15-year funding agreement with the Council 
um, the total for the current financial year is $243,000. A financial review last year demonstrated the real costs of the services which we delivered in the current financial year to Council is $408,000. The budgeted funding Council has nominated for the Eco Centre of $200,000 is therefore less than half the amount required by the Eco Centre to deliver current programs for Council. So for the past 15 years, the Eco Centre has been subsidising the Council services by using grants money that we have got from other sources and donations to um, cross-subsidise services provided to Council, our staff volunteering many hours beyond their contracted hours, and also we have absorbed um, staff payroll increases which now comply with the current awards. So any funding cut below the $408,000 budget will not be without ramifications, unfortunately. The impacts of any budget cut will include loss of staff numbers, diminished ability to secure grant and donation monies, which for every $1 from the Council, we manage to leverage $3 from other sources. So any financial loss in the budget from Council will um, include greater financial losses for us. Uh, we'll lose organisational knowledge and reduce participation of volunteers and residents and students in our programs. The cutting of programs to fit the budget allocated by Council, um, so in order to protect the brand and the high regard the Port Phillip Eco Centre has worked strenuously to establish we will need to explain the program closures are due to funding cuts from the Council. We anticipate a severe community outcry from residents. In conclusion, we ask for councillors to vote for an amendment to council's draft budget to make available funding of $408,000 per annum for the Eco Centre to continue its exemplary role in consolidating our community and providing for its well-being now and into the future. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, Daniel Coleman, please. Thank you, Dan Coleman, resident of Elwood, and I believe council members are well aware that council provides year in, year out at most a third of the Eco Centre's budget. Um, anyway, but what I'm here to talk about... So I, I missed that? What, what was that, Daniel? I just said that I think the Council members are all aware that, you, that the city provides only about a third or less of Eco Center's budget year in, year out, as opposed to what someone alleged earlier. Um, I'm just supporting uh, Ms. Seymour's statement, I guess, right. in that regard. And it's an assumption I have that you all know that, having seen we dealt with this question in the past. Anyway, that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., who famously said, in the end, we will remember not the actions of our enemies, but the inaction of our friends. He was referring to the liberals of the 1960s who talked a good game on civil rights, but never showed up when it counted. Here in Australia, we just had the climate emergency election, and so far, the climate has lost. But is the climate winning here in Port Phillip? So many of us think we have a progressive-minded council, one which understands the dire imperatives of the times we live in. Yet here we have the Eco Center, one of Australia's premier environmental organizations, languishing year after year with inadequate funds. Please, do not be the inactive friends that Dr. King reviled. Step up and do the right thing. Be remembered as climate heroes, not as climate chumps. Surely there is a majority among the nine of you who wants to look your grandchildren in the eye one day and be able to say, I did what I could. Thank you. Uh, Joe Samuel King.
Joe Samuel King, Elwood resident. That was beautiful. Thank you. So I'm, I'm here to speak a little of the history of the Port Phillip Eco Centre. It is, I'm proud to say, as old as my son is old, he's about to turn 20. Back 20 odd years ago, it was the city of Port Phillip who founded the Port Phillip Eco Centre. It was a then councillor, Frida Ehrlich, and a council staff member, Neil Blake. And they had the idea with a number of residents to form a hub for all of the burgeoning uh, environmental groups, a place where different people could merge and be supported in doing practical local things for the environment. At the same time, Earthcare St Kilda had the idea that that building could become a model sustainable building. And that was how the old gardener's cottage became the eco-centre and the eco-house that we now all know and love. Right from the beginning, the city of Port Phillip was absolutely committed to the Port Phillip eco-centre. This was expressed not only in giving over that old building, but also by solid baseline funding. I recall that in the 1990s, late 1990s, around the time of my son's birth, that it was a good 130,000 per annum that the city of Port Phillip was committing to baseline funding. 20 years have passed, the eco centre has grown, and in, over the, and in those 20 years, the cost of business has also grown. And I know as well as you do, that 130,000 then does not equate to 157,000 per annum now. They're just not comparable figures. So I ask you all, and I think I know the answer, are you as committed as your predecessors were to the Port Phillip Eco Centre? Are the environmental issues that we're now facing any less pressing than they were back then? Do you want to see the organisation thrive? I know the answer, you are. So please um, reflect this in a realistic commitment to baseline core funding. Thank you. Marcus Quinn. Thank you, councillors. Um, my name is Marcus Quinn and I'm an Elwood resident. Um, tonight, as you consider the budget, I want to make a case to you about prudent financial management. I've spent more than 20 years of my career in corporate strategy. I've been a director of strategy at some of the biggest companies in Australia. These include companies like Foster's and Tiptop Bakeries. Almost every strategic decision has one key principle at its heart. Where do you get the best return on your investment? I'm here to tell you that one of the best returns in the city of Port Phillip is the Port Phillip Ecocentre. Eco Every dollar the city invests in the Ecocentre delivers a 14-fold return in economic impact. 14-fold. Last year there were over 16,000 volunteer hours. Think about it. Over 15 years that's almost a quarter of a million hours, all volunteers. Where else do you get that sort of return? At a library that no one visits, at an art precinct that a few people visit. Last year, the Eco Centre ran school programs for over 8,000 primary school students. These are visits you can count. The future for delivering services is to harness the role of volunteers and to work in partnerships with community organisations. This is not about which project is more deserving. There are no undeserving projects. Those were whittled away years ago. It's about where the City of Port Phillip gets the best return for the community. What I love about my council, the City of Port Phillip, is that you're pragmatic. You want to see real decisions based on real evidence and real returns. The Port Phillip Eco Centre delivers and your investment there will deliver real returns. Thanks, Marcus. Okay, um, councillors, questions? Sorry, there's a... You weren't on the list. I was the first in. 
and the best dressed. Murray saw it. You've accepted it. I've accepted it. Okay. It was the first one, honestly. Okay, so no repetition rule. Geoffrey Love, Eco Centre, one of many voices uh, for the Eco Centre <clears throat> and the sole voice for, the, uh, for drainage, which uh, might echo down the years as it echoes down the drains. <laughs> uh, firstly, to add my voice to the Port Phillip Eco Centre, uh, as I speak as Committee of Management and um, an affiliate, uh, core funding from the City of Port Phillip is greatly appreciated, but has only risen by about $10,000 from 2005 to 2019. Given the Eco Centre's increasing and cost-effective contribution to the delivery of uh, City of Port Phillip's sustainability programs, amongst many other things, will Council reconsider its core funding allocation to the Port Phillip Eco Centre to the $408,000 that's asked. Uh, first question. Second question. <clears throat> I note that drainage funding for 2018-19 was 4,195,000. It's on page uh, 195 of your budget documents, councillors. Um, <clears throat> and for 2019-20, uh, it's been, it's $2,074,000. This is more than halving the capital budget for the urgent and important issue of drainage and the impact of flooding. Can Council explain this down, downgrading of the importance of drainage works? Thank you. Councillors, uh, questions? Um, I'll go Baxter, then Pearl. Um, uh, I wonder whether I might take up Mr Love's question about um, drainage. I also wondered, uh, I know you were noting down the questions about um, CPI. And so, were you going to take those up? Or, yeah, OK, cool. So I'll just take up um, Mr Love's question about drainage. Ms McNeil? Through you, Mayor, the significant difference between... Uh, the proposed budget and the 1819 budget is the Elmer Park Retention and Reuse Project, uh, which was $2.8 million. The Stormwater Infrastructure Renewal Program has actually gone up from 1.3 to 1.4 million in the proposed budget. Um, there's also a significant increase in uh, the maintenance and cleaning program for the drainage of um, $650,000. So that's actually a, um, a net increase in spending on drainage, uh, and that's supported by the CCTV program that's currently underway. Um, Council's investing in um, getting a, a very good understanding of the condition of the whole network, and that will inform future year spending. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, Councillor Pearl? Oh, sorry. Um, so it was just a follow-up, and just to clarify that, um, uh, last year's spending was also an increase on the previous year's spending on uh, drainage alone, not including the Alma Park thing. Take it on notice. I think it was, but take it on notice, yeah, okay. Councillor Pearl? Thanks, Mayor. There was lots of uh, numbers going around for the Echo Centre. I just want to confirm two things and then conversations about cuts. So can officers tell us uh, if there's any cuts at all to the funding of the Echo Centre from the City of Port Phillip? And can we get a total number of the dollar amount that's likely to be um, given in addition to core funding, the total amount of money going from the City of Port Phillip to the Echo Centre next year? What's the estimated amount? Mr Walters. Through you, Mr Mayor. Is that on? Yes, you're Sorry. sounding clear as a ding-dong. Thank you. Uh, with respect to Council Pearl's question about cuts, there are no uh, cuts to the base funding agreement, which has risen by CPI since its inception over 15 years. Council did provide a one-off $50,000 increase to base funding last year, so the uh, recommendation in the budget does 
that was a one-off thing, so it's not in this year's recommendation. So not and the total time. amount of funds that would be provided, or, or likely to be provided, in addition to base funding. Yep. Uh, so that is variable year on year because um, what you, what goes into the uh, council budget with respect to eco centres funding is for their base funding, their funding for existence, not for provision of additional services. So which is? Which is the base level, I think, is at 159, but that's thereabouts, 159,000. Um, on top of that, in the current year, we have, as one of the earlier speakers noted, provided uh, the one-off grant of $50,000 this year, $40,000 towards the schools program, and uh, 58,000, a little over a little under 59000 on consulting and other project work. That consulting and other project work is funded under the ACT and ADAPT uh, funding program, so that's um, fee-for-service type of work that the Eco Centre has provided to us, and that will vary from year to year. So 258 k And the Eco Centre redevelopment works, how much is budgeted on that for this year? The Eco Centre redevelopment uh, works as a... There is a $200,000 allocation to progress to concept design for a new eco centre, which is matched by a state um, adult grant for also 200000 So 458000 On my uh, so, so total total investment in the eco centre this year by the City of Port Phillip is two, budgeted 258000 for any proposed increase. Uh, that is uh, fa fairly close to the mark, yes. Thanks very much. I I've got some questions. Um, Mr Armstrong uh, talked about the CPI figure. My interest was the local government deflator. So we have different cost increases compared with the CPI basket of goods. And I wondered if you could recall the uh, local government deflator. Through you, uh, Mr Mayor. Um, I can't recall the exact uh, inflation number for the uh, local government. Uh, I do know that uh, our costs are increasing at higher than CPI, um, predominantly driven by the level of... Uh, construction work that we do in maintaining and improving our asset base. Um, we're budgeting expenditure in uh, the coming year if the budget is adopted of approximately $225 million. Our labour costs as a percentage, they're 96 million, they're budgeted as a percentage of that cost base is 43%. The remainder of our costs are made up of contracts, materials and services and professional services. Uh, those costs have been increasing at higher than CPI and indeed the labour costs. We're currently, as you would know, in the midst of an EBA negotiation. Our labour costs, the 96 million includes, uh, obviously reflects the net seven reduction that was alluded to by Mr Armstrong earlier, uh, but also we've built in there, although it's not uh, confirmed, we're still in negotiation, we have built in an estimate of an increase in the labour costs of 2.5%. Uh, and that would uh, basically add up to about 2.2 million of our total uh, labour base uh, of 96. Uh, the point that was made with regard to the increase in the rate revenue, the rate uh, cap increase of 2.5% delivers us just under $3 million in incremental revenue. That incremental revenue is obviously used to provide continue to provide the services, the wide portfolio services that we provide to the city, in addition to supporting the upgrade, maintenance and renewal of our asset base. So of that 2.9 million, uh, if you apply the 43% labour cost, you know, at least 1.8 million of that would be related to labour. Uh, the rest would be um, taken up by the other costs that I uh, referred to being predominantly materials and services and professional services. Thanks very much. Um, any further 
questions? Um, Councillor Simich? Sorry? Yes, you can move. Sorry, there's Councillor Crawford. We've got, I just we've want got, to make you're the mentioning the alt rec. Uh, clarify, could I? So, um, when we look at um, comparatively to other councils and employee staffs, a lot of other councils outsource many of their services so they don't have to include the outsourced employees as part of their overall council employee list so the numbers aren't sort of apples for apples. Is that correct? Um, through you, uh, Mr Mayor, that, that is uh, correct, Councillor. Um, the labour costs would be included in the cost base of those other councils, so the fact that the, it would be reflecting the fact that they're paying an external party, a third party provider to provide those labour services. Um, if I can give an example that's relevant to the City of Port Phillip, until several years ago we were engaged in a joint venture with uh, our uh, neighbours Stonington with respect to beach cleaning and street cleaning. That was basically uh, an outsourced service. When we brought that inside to uh, our uh, organisation, that obviously brought no significant amount of uh, additional uh, employment onto the FTE numbers. Okay, um, Councillor Simich, oh, sorry. Could I just ask a um, clarifying question on process at this point? Sure. So I understand that there may be some um, amendments to the budget to put, so I just wanted to ask the correct procedure here. Is the correct procedure that we put the substantive motion for adoption of the budget, and then should any councillor speak, wish to speak to an amendment to the budget? Uh, good, good question. So my suggestion to the meeting is that um, we move um, item 14.2 with um, adorned with some red as a um, if we, we move that and then there are some uh, suggestions about changing the budget in relation to two items and I suggest that they're moved as amendments and uh, so if we can just get this up and running and uh, but you, you might, the, the difficulty is if you move it, yes, you it, might be inhibited in moving an amendment. So I would I won't, I won't move it then, uh, but so, I will foreshadow that I intend to move an amendment, Mayor. Uh, yes. I'm, so I, I'm happy to move this, which is 14.2, which is um, 3.4, um, which notes the um, submissions from the special council meeting held on the 4th of June. And um, could I ask someone else to second to Councillor Brand who's unlikely to move an amendment? Doesn't mean you can't support an amendment, but you're unlikely to move an amendment. Okay, so that's been moved and seconded. Um, are there in, um, uh, now I should speak to it, and I will. And then Councillor Brand, you can choose to speak to it or not. So, um, I just want to go through this, uh, um, this substantive motion. Uh, you might note that it doesn't use the word budget, it just talks about the adoption in um, 3.5 of adopting the revised council plan pursuant to the Local Government Act. So, we are tonight moving a council plan, but it also includes budgetary figures. So if people can be cognizant of that, that tonight the resolution, the substantive resolution in 3.5 adopts a revision to the council plan, which also includes the budget of 2019, 2020. Um, notwithstanding the contention that we've heard tonight, I, I mean, I think uh, if there is one word that can um, uh, summarise this plan and attach budget, it is the word great. We have looked at our um, our uh, looked at our, our corporate plan and have made appropriate allocations. 
This has been a year of incredible achievement. We are the Bob the Builder stage of our existence. We're building all over the municipality and I'm very proud of that. Um, included in this is a number of extraordinarily important strategic advances. Um, the expenditure to um, support things such as the marina um, uh, the expression of interest. Uh, things such as some of our important waste and uh, energy um, initiatives. Uh, one thing that we're doing is uh, acknowledging that young women and girls are now getting involved in outdoor sport and we have to reimagine and reinvent our sporting facilities. All across the, um, the way of life that people live in Port Phillip, we are addressing. We're putting much more money into uh, things like uh, street and beach cleaning. We are looking at um, new green waste initiatives and those will be rolled out over the um, months. We've had an extraordinary drop in over the, since I was first elected in 1996. Hitherto it's dropped, our emissions have dropped 70 per cent in that time. I know it's a long time, but the dropping of council's emissions has been absolutely dramatic and radical, and it is going to edge down towards zero over time. So across the whole panoply of human experience in Port Phillip, I think we're doing a quite an interesting and sophisticated job of dealing with that. Now, tonight we're going to talk about two, in budgetary terms, relatively small matters. And there probably will be some heat and light expended as we battle over those amendments. But please, let's focus on the big issue that our officers have done a great job They've um, helped us be creative in so many uh, areas and you can see just from tonight with the conversations about heritage, the funding of arts, the uh, discussion over environment and, you know, and really I um, welcome the uh, ratepayers of Port Phillip coming here to make us accountable and responsible. People will walk away from this meeting over these two relatively small conversations, ecstatic or disappointed, but in budgetary terms, they are not big items. So um, I commend this budget to you and I'm happy to accept amendments and I know that there are going to be two. So Councillor Simic is itching to move an amendment. Oh, sorry, Councillor Brand. He does want to speak and I'm actually looking forward to what you say. You might repudiate everything I say. I wouldn't dare. <laughs> no, I, 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 I would, I would uh, echo many of the things that you've said and it, I just want to emphasise what a long and complex process it is that started right from when we started in council and every uh, and established the, the, the council plan and a, and a ten year, the 10 year sort of forward budget vision for the city and the, and, and the, the uh, council plan for the four years of this council and then updated year after year after year. It is a very long and drawn out process. It is incredibly well handled for us at a base level by the, by the officers. I just can't tell you how um, admiring I am of the way they handle um, the incredible depth and density of information and present it to us in a way which is understandable to us and is also extremely accommodating uh, and understanding of what we would want to do, it, do with that budget politically ourselves. And I feel, uh, I feel very, very confident that what we end up doing is, is very reflective of, our, of, of, of what we would want to be doing. Um, 
in particular, there's the discipline of the rate, uh, the rate cap, which I think is a very, it's a particular thing. It wasn't, it didn't exist when I was on council years ago. Um, I, uh, it makes, it makes uh, budgeting for local government very, very difficult because expenses, uh, all of the things that we actually budget, budget for from the fundamental necessities through to the basic requirements and expenses of running a, running a government, running a, a city, and through to meeting the needs and aspirations of the community is extremely hard. It's ever increasing, rapidly ever increasing, and this, and this uh, rate cap actually puts a very, very hard cap on that at, at two point whatever it is percent set each year. Um, the, it, it puts not only just a, a, a discipline on each year's uh, budget, it actually puts a discipline on all budgets into the future too because the way it's been structured by the state government is that you cannot exceed the rate cap but of course you can go lower but every time but you cannot average out over several years your adherence to the rate cap it, there's no going over it so you've got this problem if you go under it you are stuck with that under with that degree of underness forever and ever you cannot recover that if you need something more the next year it, that's the way it's that's the way it's structured so basically the way that you, to run a local government you do need actually to stick close to the rate cap if you are going to preserve the value of the investments that you're making on a long-term basis. It's just the way it's, it's structured and that's what, you know, it's partly is what is driving our, I'm saying there are two things that are driving our, our sticking to the rate cap. One is because we absolutely need every dollar to, to do what we're doing and two is if we don't, we actually, we actually penalise ourselves year in, year out after that because we cannot make up we cannot just work at a nice average over 10 years. We actually have to work to a limit. Anyway, that's just the way it is. I think, it's, it, I think that we actually are happy to be having... I think we all feel quite happy that we've got this discipline on us and we stick to it rigorously and we spend an enormous amount of time balancing out and trying to uh, get the best outcome out of the, uh, out of the circumstances that we are given and the constraints and disciplines within which we work. And I think this budget reflects that. So um, it's been moved and seconded. Speeches have been given. I think it's now time to entertain some amendments. Councillor Simic. Thank you, Mayor. And if you just give me one second, I've just lost it Take on my time. screen. Take your time. That's very. We want to. All right. <laughs> So um, I'd like to move a, an amendment, which is um, under 3.5. Uh, I'd like to include 3.51, uh, which reads, include an additional 100 and, oh, there we go, um, so the amount uh, of 150,000 in 2019-20 to support the re operation of the Port Phillip Eco Centre, 115. Performance reporting regarding the Eco Centre schools program, volunteer hours, youth programs, community events and operating hours of the Eco Centre reflecting the funding increase to be provided um, by the Eco Centre uh, to council at six month monthly intervals. Okay, is there a seconder for that amendment? <laughs> okay, Could, would you wish to speak to it? Thank you, Mayor. Um, we have spent a long time talking about um, the huge benefit that the Eco Centre provides to our community. Uh, Ms Seymour uh, incredibly eloquently uh, in uh, under three minutes before um, talked about the exact uh, benefit um, for the uh, amount of money that we expend um, on the Eco Centre that, that we receive back. Um, she also talked about the huge increases that the Eco Centre has experienced in delivering that program since the original funding deed uh, in 2004 was negotiated. 
Um, we as a council have also, in our terms, spent a lot, lot of time talking about how we can address the gap uh, created by um, the shortfall in funding for the Eco Centre. Um, we remember, of course, that last budget we did approve a $50,000 increase, um, and that $50,000 increase was a, a once-off payment, recognising that there were problems that we as a council needed to understand better uh, and resolve. Uh, we've really put the Eco Centre through a very rigorous process of providing us with a, a large amount of information um, to justify uh, the uh, increase that was uh, required and asked for. Uh, and I'd really like to thank uh, uh, Ms Seymour uh, and everyone else at the Eco Centre for the work they've done uh, in providing the information to Council. Uh, for me, uh, the Eco Centre is really a jewel in, in, in our Crown and such an important part of um, what we um, as the City of Port Phillip uh, represent. Um, the Eco Centre has grown enormously since it was first set up and it's wonderful that we had the opportunity to hear some of that history tonight again. But it's grown so much and provides such incredible benefit to a uh, community. Um, for me, addressing the worst effects of climate change really is the reason I um, put myself forward for council, the reason I'm involved in politics, and the reason that uh, every day uh, I'm looking at opportunities that we can do more uh, in these areas uh, of work. So we have an incredibly big uh, budget. Uh, we are expending a lot of money, and I do want to make sure that every bit of money that we expend is justified. Uh, in this instance, I believe that this increase is justified. Um, I know that the Eco Centre presented and um, asked for more, uh, and I uh, personally think that uh, more is justified. Uh, but this, this amount, um, I believe and I hope, uh, will achieve uh, a majority of councillor support uh, tonight. Um, but um, to know as well that, um, uh, and I am really hopeful that um, uh, if this is adopted, um, that we do continue to work with the Eco Centre and look at other ways that we can support, support their work. So um, I won't talk much more at this point. I know that other councillors are also itching to say something um, and I'll uh, reserve my right as well to uh, respond at the end. Mm -hmm. So uh, I really hope that we can get this across the line tonight. You don't get a close on amendments, do you? Through, through Mr. May, sorry to interrupt, Mr. Councillor Smith. Just want to clarify some aspects of your amendment. So it is you're proposing, just so I can help with wording, um, you're proposing that this is a one-off additional 115 in 1920, 2019-20 only. So it's a one-off. It's not an increase to the base. Is that correct? Uh, no. The intention was for there to be uh, an ongoing increase. Right. So we probably need to look at... So perhaps I can... Is that... I just wanted to clarify that because if, it, if, if you're adding... If the intention is to add 115,000 to the base, that should probably be reflected more accurately in the wording of the amendment. Um, so after... Um, one thousand. Might seek some help, from Mr. Walters. Here, can we say me. in base funding? So, through you, Mr. Mayor, if that's your intent, and we'll just need to check with the seconder, it will be to include an additional one hundred and fifteen thousand into the base funding of the Eco Centre from from two thousand nineteen twenty. Just to be clear, uh, from. 2019-20 to support the operations. If that's fine. From and including. Uh, from and including. Yep. If you want to be really clear. Uh, um, and then performance reporting. So you're seeking in that last part of the motion, Councillor Simich, to get performance reporting on the positive impact of the extra funding. Or is that is that the intent? That was what was um, suggested to me uh, yeah. by officers. Uh, uh, I apologise, I didn't say this to talk before. Uh, no, that's okay. And so um, I, I'm happy to include that. Um, so put, uh, I just added in performance reporting uh, on the positive effect of the additional funding in relation to the schools program volunteer. So take out regarding and put in relation to the Eco Centre Schools Program 
and take out and and the opening as they can send a is to be is to be take out the words reflecting the funding increase because I think that's just is and put in is to be provided by the Centre Council at six monthly intervals. Does that does that meet your intent, Councillor? Yes, thank I think you, it's CEO. A bit that's uh, much you. better. Yeah, uh, as a seconder, still happy to second. Sorry. You're still happy to second it on. No. No. Okay, uh, Councillor Crawford, do you wish to speak to that? Firstly, I'll say that um, as a councillor, we look at the big picture across the whole municipality, but I actually was elected to represent my constituency in Canal Ward, and I heard what Canal Ward said to me tonight. Secondly, I'd like to say that, you know what, most of the litter in Melbourne ends up in our municipality and our bay anyway. So we're dealing with a lot more rubbish than just ours. And the Eco Centre is part of that amazing community that cares about the litter that turns up in our municipality and pollutes our bay. And they care about keeping our streets clean and they care about so many things. You know, there have been other levels of government that have abdicated their responsibilities in addressing climate change and pollution and, and doing the right thing by the environment generally. And I think local council uh, is often stepping into the space where people step away from their responsibilities. And we're really lucky to have a group of people who we fund to some degree, who give us their passion and their care. And if you want to put it into monetary terms, because it, although I don't think budgets is only about monetary terms, I think it's about what you value. And uh, we, I think that if you want to put it in monetary terms, we do when we give out grants, we value volunteer hours at about $25 an hour. So we're getting a hell of a lot of bang for our buck. It, it makes, you know, I, I'm no mathematician, but whatever you set out there, it's a lot of hours. Um, and I think the thing that strikes me most is we're working with young people. And unfortunately, with climate change coming down the barrel at us, the biggest thing we can hope for is behaviour change. And it starts early and the Eco Centre is part of that change. And it's also about connecting with youth on a, on a, not just a young level, but that mid-level as well. And it's also about connecting our community. And I will speak to the wider budget later, but I think social cohesion and what makes a good community and people want to live in an area, it's lots of little things that add up to big things. And part of it's being able to go to the botanic gardens and to participate in things that don't, co don't cost money or to see the beautiful flowers that, you know, are so carefully cared for or find out how to recycle properly. But it's about all the little things and it's about the people you meet at these safe, inclusive spaces around some positive and, and shared purpose. And so for that reason, I will be supporting the $115,000 uh, for the funding grant extra a week. I always think about the arts. You put a dollar in for the arts and you get, God, between 5 to $10 back and it's been proven. We bring, boil everything down to economics and it's not always about economics. But these are the things that you can't measure in a bottom line and they're actually the things that matter most. So I am happy to support the Eco Centre tonight. Anyone else? I might say something. As I sit here, I sort of don't know how I'm going to vote on this. Um, let me ventilate a few thoughts, though. So on the figures we have here, it's 258k in, so a quarter of a million dollars in recurrent funding and 200 for planning the new centre, plus rent free, which must be another, what, 40k. So it's near as damn to half a million dollars. In local government land, no other community groups gets anywhere near that. Major artistic theatrical companies are delirious when they get 30 grand. It's a hell of an amount of money. 
So this is a hell of an organisation, though. I do want to correct the record. Someone said that I wasn't the founder of the Eco Centre when I was the mayor and the ward councillor at the time. We took a decrepit building and stuck it in there. So clearly, you know, I, I think the Eco Centre and the St Kilda Housing Association are the two great creations of this council. And they're great creations because they sprout wings and leave us. And I sense that the eco centre's sort of in that transition. It's sort of half our property, half not. It has significant educational and regional programs. And we've been told tonight evidence of that. But when I hear about uh, educational programs, I immediately think cost shift from the education department. When I hear regional programs, I think cost shift from the state government. So it's not that it's not fantastic work, it is, but it's all about who should pay. Um, and then I hear that, well, in fact, we're only going to be providing a proportion of the financial support for the eco centre. And, um, and that, that's great because the cost shift isn't as much as I feared. Um, but, you know, it just makes it difficult for us in our, our straightened times when we're cutting back on all sorts of things that we love and adore, that we put half a million dollars to one organisation. That does great work. No one's denying that. But the proportionality on our budget, it really challenges me. So I'll just sit and stew on that while we um, go to the vote soon. Is there any other speakers? Councillor Baxter. I had to give the Queen wave there for you. <laughs> it um, was very queenly. <laughs> so um, I, I want to speak in uh, support of this amendment. Um, there are a couple of things I want to say. One is that I, I did just want to correct a couple of things they're saying that, you know, we don't, we don't invest uh, this kind of money in other community organisations. Um, we do. We give, we give scads of money to groups like Linden and Gasworks because of the benefit that we see out of them. Um, I know that uh, the St Kilda Festival, for example, we put a huge amount of money into, and a lot of people say, geez, that's an enormous amount of money. And then what it comes back to, well, the economic benefit to the area is, you know, seven bucks to every dollar or something like that. And people go, oh, OK, yeah. Well, yeah, we can see why that would be the case. Um, I think it's seven. Uh, you know, I might, I might be slightly wrong on that. But it could be 14. Yeah, all right. So if it's 14, it's, uh, then what we're talking about is a similar sort of benefit than we're seeing to the Eco Centre. So it's not right to say that we don't, we don't invest in uh, arts and culture uh, in the same way, which we do, um, but I think we need to invest in our environmental uh, programs in the same way. Um, I think all the arguments made about how the funding hasn't uh, kept pace with the growth of the organisation, the growth of our council, the growth of our community, um, are very fair arguments uh, to make. Um, I think that uh, what the Eco Centre does for us um, in delivering on a lot of the outcomes in our council plan uh, and our uh, act and adapt strategy, um, that they do uh, often free of charge through volunteer uh, work and it's really amazing stuff. Um, it's not just that, though. It's, it's the place that the Eco Centre actually holds in our community. We had so many people email us, call us and come to this meeting to say, not um, this is a good organisation, you, you should fund it, but that they love the Eco Centre, that they love the people that they uh, work, work with or volunteer with with the Eco Centre. They love um, the, what, what the Eco Centre provides in their life and their community. Um, it's a really special place uh, and it came about, you know, in some ways quite accidentally. I mean, it, was, it was obviously planned in a way, but the, the way that it's developed has developed really organically and, and become this uh, incredibly special organisation. And I think that um, it's about time that we 
uh, increase our, our, our funding to match that. Um, I would be in favour of, of uh, funding a whole lot more, but I think this figure has, has sort of been arrived at because um, there, there are some councillors who... Um, you know, sort of have, have some concern about what, you know, our budget uh, situation is and want to balance that with their support for the Eco Centre. And that's fair enough. I have a different opinion. I um, want, to, want to give more money to the Eco Centre, but that's what council is, is like. And, and uh, we've, we've ended up at, at some sort of compromise figure that we hope will provide um, some of the benefits that we, we really want to see uh, continuing coming from the Eco Centre. So... Um, that's why I'll be supporting this amendment, uh, and I really hope my fellow councillors do as well. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you. Yep, I'm not going to repeat. Um, just to thank everyone who's been in touch. I agree with the overwhelming support that's been shown by the community that the eco centre is an absolutely essential, um, providing absolutely essential and much wanted um, services to our community. I'd also like to state on the public record that I um, accept the information that's been put forward by the eCare Centre as well. And I uh, really urge those who've been um, active in the advocacy to continue to advocate on behalf of your eco centre. I certainly hope that this is the start and not the end of conversations around um, how we support eco centre going forward. Um, it's very well demonstrated the amazing benefit that has returned to the community through Council's investment in this asset. I understand that the Eco Centre um, also works really hard to, um, to secure funding from other sources. Um, and so I think that you work hard in that respect as well. I certainly think that um, Council's got an important role in uh, supporting this organisation which delivers so much within Port Phillip and delivers such essential environmental benefit but also economic development benefit um, which translates into taking care of the things that people come to our municipality to enjoy and choose to live in our municipality um, because of our incredible natural assets. Thank you for all the work that you've done, um, not just preserving those but enhancing them. I, I hope that we can continue um, to really do that. Some of the biodiversity things that we have coming up uh, I think are really exciting and so I, I feel this is not enough, but it might be this, you know it might be what we can get um, tonight, and I hope that we can continue to talk about how we support you. Just in closing, you know, councillors have been talking about behaviour change and where things start. Councillors have been visiting a lot of childcare centres um, in recent times because we've got the child Relevance. child services review, and the relevancy is that at a number of the childcare centres that we've visited. Um, something that has come up in the conversation is the seedlings program and how much uh, of a difference it is making to um, very little kids to get that interaction with okay, their environment at their first... Okay, I think that's barely first. relevant. <laughs> I, think, I think that it's a real example of where the Eco Centre is de um, delivering change yeah. for life in our citizens and um, driving such an important cultural force. So thank you for all you do. I'm very happy to support this amendment tonight. Councillor Pearl. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I don't support the amendment this evening, which shouldn't come as a surprise to councillors, and I'll try and convince you in the short time I have here uh, to vote against this. And the main purpose of that is, is we'll agree the Echo Centre does great work, but we've put millions and millions of dollars into supporting this group, uh, and it's been a huge success. But in my view, the group would be stronger in the future if they fairly competed for the resources. I, mean, I guess the analogy should, that should be used is uh, an eagle that stays in the nest too long, and the echo centre is a very strong eagle now with large wings. Uh, if it stays there for too long, it becomes a turkey because it can't support itself and it can't feed for itself. And if we continue the drip feed, increase amounts of funding to the echo centre, I think we're actually limiting them in their future potential and what they can actually achieve as a group. If we increase the funding to the level that we're proposing this evening, we get to about $573,000 this year in direct financial commitment plus the indirect financial commitment that's been suggested before. To put that in perspective, um, that's more than double what we provide for food services and social support grants. That's 10 times what we provide to Southport Daylinks, which provide 
uh, a huge amount of service and they're trying to expand that service, but they can't do it in Canal Ward because they have funding limitations at the moment. And 20 times what we provide the Sacred Heart Mission, uh, which service more people and have more volunteer hours potentially than the Echo Centre does, 20 times the funding that we provide to that, that important group, and 25 times what we provide to the Caring Mums group. I support the officer's recommendation and I don't think we should contradict the officer's recommendation. They've clearly said to us that this funding isn't, increased funding isn't warranted because it doesn't align with our council plan objectives. For that reason alone, councillors, I'd strongly urge you not to vote this down and review this funding in the light of day and let it compete with other community groups like the one I've mentioned here before. It's not fair and it's not equitable and it's not transparent for us to bring amendments like this to this floor to support a single community group when there could be others that could provide a better financial return, a better social return and a better environmental return. For that reason, I'd ask you to vote against the motion here this evening. Councillor Bond. And to continue from Councillor Bell's theme, that's $573,000 more than we provide Beach Patrol. Um, who do, again, thousands of volunteer hours down there on the beach picking up that litter that Councillor Crawford spoke about. Um, it'd be great to see some of those councillors willing to or wishing to save the planet with financial resources from the City of Port Phillip make their way down to Beach Patrol occasionally and pick up some rubbish. I don't think I've ever seen any of them down there. Councillor Gross and Brand, the exceptions, and Councillor Pearl I've seen down there as well. Um, the others I haven't yet to see down there. It'd be wonderful to see you all come along to St Kilda Beach Patrol and... And, and contribute, pick up that rubbish that we've been talking about. I also won't be supporting this. I think uh, there's, you know, $575,000, I think, we've just added to our budgets or the next five years' budgets tonight. Um, with, with the stroke of a pen, it's irresponsible to be doing budgets like this, especially in the current environment. We, you know, we're clearly... Um, our rates are certainly excessive for a certain amount of people and we're under increased scrutiny for the way we spend it. Um, but it seems that we just sit here and... Um, throw money out like it's confetti. So it's very disappointing that this is how it's happened, but I also won't be supporting this. Councillor Brand. I will be supporting this motion. Um, I think it's... Uh, I, I, I agree that there are slightly uh, um, unusual circumstances that we're making this um, Amendment to the budget. Uh, my understanding is that um, uh, this is a year that we are actually um, negotiating the funding agreement with uh, the Eco Centre, and this the actual amount has to be decided in this budget round, um, and it's an amount which has only ever been uh, increasing by. CPI of the base funding for so long, and the actual performance of the uh, of the uh, eco centre has been expanding like an exponential. Um, well, I suppose CPI is exponential too, technically, isn't it? How do I describe <laughs> it? Super no, exponential. Not technically, actually. <laughs> actually, actually. Right. <laughs> yes, um, it's it's producing at a different exponent. Ex Exponent, I think, is that'll be it. Um, uh, so there has, over the last, how was it, 15 years, um, none of the none of the expanded success and the actual sort of the the, 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 the change in scope and brilliance of the uh, of the success and uh, and uh, the things that the, the extent of what what the eco centre has has done and become is reflected in that, in that CPI growth of the base funding. We're in a situation where we need to make some attempt at recognising the different scale of operation that this organisation does. Last, week, last year we added $50,000 to the, as a one-off thing just as a, as a step up to somewhere near what we thought was the level that it was operating on and deserved to be funded at. This year we're in another situation where we're not 100% nailed down of exactly what is needed. There are a whole lot of really, uh, the arguments have come from 
um, from e the ECHO Centre itself, saying that what they need to continue in the same vein is an extra $240,000, full of good argumentation, full of good documentation. What we are offering tonight is actually less than half of that, which pains me, but it is also it is also an attempt to find at least something which is of some compatible scale to what is needed at the moment. For this, oper for this operation, one of the greatest, most brilliant successes in this city to keep on going in the way that it's going. There have been two further arguments against it uh, just raised uh, recent, just in the last few minutes. Um, uh, Councillor Pearl's uh, contention that it would be better off if it was a little bit more starved of funds and it would get out of the nest and fly off earlier. I, I think that's a good metaphor in, in many circumstances, but it, it, it's only going to be true at a certain point in life. Um, my feeling is that you know if you've got to, if you're wanting, as Councillor, uh, as the Mayor suggests, um, if you really want the Eco Centre to get off and fly like a rocket, well, this is, we're putting, we're doing the, uh, the booster rocket and it's not going to work if it splutters and fails, you know, sort of halfway out of the atmosphere. And that's where we are at the moment. We're sort of, we're, we're the, the booster rocket that may produce that flight. Um, well, you know, I don't think kicking it out of the nest is, you know, all that great. Um, the cost shift, uh, maybe our halfway mark is a, is, is a, is, is a good compromise on, um, on allowing that uh, the cost shift should also be uh, uh, an income shift. Uh, but we, with, with, with the other institutions in our city like that Councillor Baxter mentioned, like Linden and Gasworks, we do not expect those two bodies to be parochial, totally local uh, institutions. They have, to, they have to function on the stage of the city. Linden has to be Linden has to be a a, a a player in the city of Melbourne in the whole metropolis, not just in the city of Port Phillip, for it to be the sort of art centre that the city of Port Phillip needs. True. Gasworks needs to function in the Melbourne, you know, the, the the full on in the Melbourne sort of cultural ecology. It needs to be a big player in that for it to be the valuable thing that we have in our midst. The same with the eco centre. It has to spread much wider than just the streets and beaches of the city of Port Phillip. It needs to it it needs to, to work at a much larger scale, and we are we are privileged and lucky and well served to have it spreading further than our boundaries. It serves us best being that way, in so many different ways. So I don't think the cost shift thing is a real problem there. I think that we hit a we've hit a mark where most of us can feel. Uh, content with the pros and cons, the balance of the pros and cons, um, I would like it to be more myself, um, but um, I, I just think this is a good spot to be in and I will certainly be supporting it. Move to the vote. All those... Division, right? Sorry? Division? Sure. Let's go under division from the get-go. All those in favour? Um, Copsey. Councillors Copsey, Simich, Brand... Gross, Crawford, Baxter, against, Councillors Bond and Pearl. Declare that carried. Um, I, I, I suspect we've got another amendment to be made. Councillor Crawford. I'd like to propose another amendment, if I may. Mayor? Sure. It reads uh, that we would Is it the next part down? enter into a 12-month agreement with the National Trust of Australia, brackets Victoria, for free City of Port Phillip resident accents to Ripponlea Estate to the value of $20,000 with incentive-based bonuses up to the value of $50,000. Is there a seconder for that? Second of Councillor Brand. Um, do you wish to speak to that? Do. So often we hear councillors refer to um, we do strategy plans and they sit on the shelf and collect dust and we don't achieve much and then we spend more money on doing a, another strategic plan 10 years down the track. Well, a long time ago on a strategic plan, uh, 
down the canal ward end, uh, it identified that the least amount of open space uh, available to residents is in East St Kilda, Ripponlea area. And we haven't done a lot since then. And there's many reasons for that. I'm not pointing any fingers. But we're here we have an opportunity to change that. It's about innovative thinking. We don't have any great tracts of land uh, at this end of the municipality, unlike Fisherman's Bend, which has possibility. We uh, don't have Albert Park. We don't have much of uh, new possibilities for East St Kilda and Ripponlea residents. But across the road on our borderline, there is a magnificent property, Ripponlea Estate, that is magnificent and is managed and looked after by somebody else. So what is more innovative than looking to the Glenira model where they pay some money to the um, National Trust to maintain these magnificent gardens and also allow free access for their residents? Now, people in uh, Port Phillip who live on the Hotham, our side of Hotham Street don't really understand that there's a boundary. Just like water doesn't respect boundaries, as we know down the Canal Island Board, neither do people. They don't get it. It's just across the street. Why shouldn't they be allowed in for free? So here we have an opportunity to deliver on something strategically we have identified about a decade ago. And it's really affordable. We don't have to maintain it. It's cheaper than us buying land and maintaining it for the, you know, perpetuity. This gives our residents access to an incredible heritage site, which we want to help maintain in the face of, you know, drier summers, climate change and all the like. So I'm asking my fellow councillors to support this amendment. It's a small amount of money to take to allow our residents access to something so incredibly beautiful. And as I walked through there the other day, I thought, particularly for vulnerable families or that intervention point as a young kid, if you got to walk through the magical gardens that are Ripponlea Estate and that you felt like you deserved to be in a place like that, that's game changing. Mad it actually can change the trajectory of the life. The gardens are that incredible. Someone had a vision a long time ago to do something so beautiful and wonderful. I think it's time for Port Phillip to have a vision. Think outside the box and, and look and provide more open space for our residents in a city that's densifying all the time. Please support this amendment. Councillor Brand. Yes, I think this is a, a small amount to be paid on a brilliant idea. Um, it actually, it's 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 going. It is such a beautiful garden uh, of, of of world standard, just right on our doorstep, and it's probably going to be the cheapest free park that we are actually going to sort of, in a sense, uh, in inverted commas, obviously acquire. But it it's it's a clever way of sort of acquiring it for the local uh, the local community there to have a free park, right next to them, which is just so incredibly beautiful and excellent. Um, it just seems like a really great idea. We're going to test it out. Um, if you know, We'll see what the uptake is. I hope it's extreme. Um, it should be. And um, I just think it's a clever idea and I'm happy, very happy to support it. Um, I'll leave it at that. Any other takers? Councillor Baxter. Um, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I will be supporting uh, this motion. Um, I'm just slightly distracted by all the conversations going on. I'm wondering whether something's wrong. Just focus on yourself, Well, I've just overheard the CEO saying there might be some clarification needed. So um... through you, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Baxter. Again, oh, we should have checked these before. I do apologise, councillors. Um, we just want to clarify that. Uh, with the mover, it's to the value of 20,000 with incentive based bonus up to an additional 30,000 to a total value of 50,000. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think if we could just change that with the uh, consent of the mover and seconder. Thank you, Ms. Bennett. So it says up to 30,000, up to, uh, up to an additional 30,000 for a total, to be clear, for a total value of 50,000. That, and that's very clear then. 
So it's not 70 all up, it's 50 all up. Thank you. Thanks very much, officers. That's uh, great. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Is that okay? That's okay with the mover. Is it okay with the seconder? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, yeah, look, I, I will be supporting uh, this motion, even though it's been changed before my very eyes. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, see, uh, I see this as, uh, as an interesting experiment um, to see whether this will work. Um, it is difficult to make new green open space uh, in, in our really dense city. We would have to uh, spend millions of dollars acquiring a site, remediating it, and then um, turning it into a park. And we have done that um, the, uh, uh, up in Montague uh, Precinct, uh, but it is, it, it's extremely difficult. And um, the way that we can look at uh, models that allow us to actually better utilise existing open space uh, is worth looking at. The biggest hurdle to this is that Ripon Lee Gardens is not within the city of Port Phillip. And I know that, you know, I don't want to put words in Councillor Bond's mouth, but I know that's going to be something he's going to say. Um, and, I, and I acknowledge that that is an issue. Um, but what I... <laughs> OK, well, maybe I'm wrong. All right, all right, I'm sorry, I don't mean to put words in here, am I? Um, <laughs> But uh, <laughs> we've said it before. But anyway, um, this is so. So it is. It, it is an issue. Um, but it is. It is. Right, it was literally on the border, uh, and I think that, um, that given its given its proximity to an area that has a, 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 a real lack of uh, green open space, it is absolutely worth our time and money to uh, test out whether this will be a benefit benefit to our municipality. This is not. Uh, an, an ongoing agreement um, like uh, Glen Ira uh, has signed for for a continuous sort of year on year sort of thing. It is a, a bit of a test to see how well our um, residents take up this opportunity to visit these absolutely gorgeous gardens and I um, uh, am very happy to to see that tried out and see whether um, people are, are happy to cross over Hotham Street. Um, I live very, very close to these gardens and I, there is, for me, some kind of psychological barrier of Hotham Street, which is insane, uh, um, but it's there. Um, but I, I'm hoping that the lure of the gorgeous gardens will uh, overcome that and that we'll get a really good outcome here. I want to um, commend uh, Councillor um, Crawford for, uh, for putting the motion because it's something that's definitely worth considering and Councillor Gross for um, sort of initiating it, harping on it, badgering councillors about it, um, making a video, making a video about it, um, talking incessantly about it um, and annoying me non-stop. Uh, but uh, thanks to Councillor Gross for his leadership on this uh, particular issue. Any other speakers? Councillor Simic. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll also be uh, supporting this tonight. Um, I won't uh, add much more to what's been talked about, um, uh, other than to point out that there is a difference between uh, a, a free community park and a, a paid private park. Uh, and what we're really doing by supporting this uh, very small uh, amendment to the budget, a very small increase in funding to the budget, is creating uh, a, a, another um, free uh, community option. Um, for people to go uh, and really uh, enjoy a beautiful place to uh, recreate. Um, I uh, do want to see um, Council take part in initiatives that create more open space. Um, this doesn't necessarily create more open space, it provides more open space, um, but some of those uh, options are much more expensive. So it's something that we need to work to towards, uh, particularly with uh, Fisherman Bend coming online. Uh, and uh, a, a, a huge increase in our population um, uh, over time. Um, but uh, I know that we've got that uh, in some of our other strategies uh, already, and it is something that we are looking at and working towards. Um, this is a, a step uh, towards that, um, so we'll be supporting it tonight. Any other speakers? Councillor Bond. Um, where do I start? Else? I, I, I haven't got your point down here, Councillor Baxter, but Elstonwick Park is about 250 metres down the road. Anyone who wants to go to public open space, just walk down Hotham Street to cross the, cross the freeway or the highway, whatever it's called, and go to Elstonwick Park. And the best part about Elstonwick Park is that 
that the like Rip and Lee, it's also paid for by someone else. It's in the city of Bayside. Go down and enjoy their park. Um, Councillor Crawford mentioned our open stra space strategy, which has been sitting on a shelf here for I don't know how many years. Um, I'd hate to point out to Councillor Crawford that this proposal does not create a single extra blade of grass. That grass in Rip and Lee already exists. So our, our open space strategy still sits on the, on the shelf there. With, we dust off every now and again. Um, no one has ever been prevented from going Rip and Lee. The only thing is you have to pay there. People, the residents of Port Phillip, are free to go to Rip and Lee any time they choose and have been free to go to Rip and Lee any time they choose for the, the past, I don't know, 100 years or however long it's been a public park. Um, all of, the only difference is they've had to pay to do it. Now, I'm a big fan of the zoo. I'd love to go to the zoo for free. But when I do decide to go to the zoo, cross over into the city of Melbourne, I pay to go there. It's exactly what needs to happen here if someone in, lives in that area of Port Phillip wants to pay to go to Rip and Lee. I've heard this, this, this money, it's been described as cheap, very small and insignificant amount, but it, I'll put it to Rhonda, Bruce, Lindsay, Campbell and Christina. Between the five of you, you probably pay about 20 grand a year in rates to the city of Port Phillip, don't you? Is your rates contribution right now feeling very small, insignificant, cheap? Or are you thinking, what a, what a great way to, to spend the 20 grand that the five of you contribute to the city of Port Phillip? Uh, could you please speak to the issue, please? I, th I believe I am speaking to the issue, Councillor Gross. Are you? Yeah, I'm explaining to them where their rates go. They're 20 grand up on the up on the wall. Um, where was I before I was interrupted? Uh, I'll, I'll leave it there, but I think you've all got the point. This isn't a cheap a cheap exercise. It isn't in Port Phillip. So this is a, this is new and ridiculous ways that this council has managed to spend money. Um, you know, at least the million dollars we propose to give to to Bayside. For the for the Alston Week Park water retention does have some flow-on benefits to the city of Port Phillip, but in this particular instance, it's nothing but throwing money to a, another municipality. And I, I certainly look forward to a contribution from the city of Glenora towards the Eco Centre when their budget comes to their council in a in a week or two's time. It'd be wonderful. Somehow, I don't think they'll be as um, flippant with their money as as we appear to be tonight. Any other speakers? Oh, I'll say a few words. Um, I just want to um, talk about a couple of um, Councillor Bond's points. Um, in the 2000, uh, 2009 open space strategy, it said that the Nepean Highway was a significant barrier for people who want to enjoy open space. So um, I think that that's an important aspect. And when you have a look at the postcode analysis of the National Trust, that takes into account um, the various barriers. And people don't cross the Pean Highway, but they do cross um, other roads leading to that. So, my, my reading of the postcode analysis of the National, uh, National Trust data said that there's a barrier from the west, but not so from the east. Secondly, um, Councillor Bond said, and I think it's a good point, you know, we haven't created another great blade of grass. What we have created is, <laughs> is um, a huge area of usable open space. So we haven't created open space, we've created by this usable open space. And to, uh, because at the moment with the entry fee, it's just not accessible. It is a barrier to many people. And in my famous film that um, has been alluded to, I went there on a day at noon, it was, sun was shining, it was 22 degrees, it was lunchtime, and the place was empty. So uh, that is a significant barrier and the usable aspect of the, um, uh, usable aspect of this is important. And I would say to Rob, who are concerned quite justifiably with uh, intelligent, rational and prudent use of money, 
that this is incredibly cost effective. For us to maintain the botanical gardens cost $400,000. This would cost about half a million and it would be utterly unaffordable to buy. So with a bit of innovation and a relatively small amount of money, we are creating access to usable space. And in the strategy that uh, I've alluded to, the 2009 Open Space Strategy, what it said is that, first of all, our residents in this area are more deprived than any other area of open space because they're nowhere near the foreshore, they're nowhere near Albert Park and they're nowhere near all of the Port Melbourne parks. So that deprivation is exacerbated by the fact that the city of Glen Ira has less open space than any other city in the Melbourne metropolitan area. So you put the two of them together, there's only two bits of open space. One's the Alma Park, which we all love, and the other's the cemetery, and, um, which is dead to me. Um, <laughs> Oi, gewalt. Um, and people do have a death taboo and can't kick a footy in the cemetery, for God's sake. So, and dogs off lead. So... Um, Look, I'm looking forward to this experiment because I think it'll be a low-cost way of accessing open space for our residents. Much needs to change. The place shuts at five. It doesn't have good hospitality. Um, that will change over the, over the years and it will become a vibrant hub for Glen Ira and Port Phillip residents to gather and enjoy. <laughs> Are you going to make a video? <laughs> You need to make a video. You haven't lived unless you've made a video. <laughs> OK, let's move to the vote. I don't think you get a... You don't get a close in amendments. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, that's really frustrating. I'm sorry, Lou. All those in favour of the Crawford Amendment? It's uh, carried. Can I Again? request a division for it? Oh, sorry. Div division? All those in favour? That's uh, Copsey, Simich, Brand, uh, Baxter, Crawford and Gross, and against Bond and Pearl. I now want to move to the main um, uh, motion, the substantive motion which I moved and spoke to and it's been spoken to by the seconder, Councillor Brand. Um, does anyone wish to speak? Yes. Councillor, this is your moment. Councillor Crawford, you can I, slip I, them I in. usually try not to speak for a long time, and I will try to be efficient, but I do have a lot of points to make. So the few things I just want to um, address, starting with, we acknowledge that it is part of our responsibility to be um, careful um, and prudent with the money. We already have an imposed 2.5% rate cap and in a society which is constantly increasing and big challenges constantly coming down the line that we need to deal with, we are already being very prudent. I acknowledge that some people, at, you know, depending on, the, on the, the free market house prices in a year, bear the burden more than others. I live in a very small 40 square metres I don't have on, on a flat, and I pay my portionate share, trust me, and I'd be happy to pay more. And, and small amounts, if we didn't take the rate increase, if we contribute it back to all the ratepayers, it would be a small amount of money. But collectively, that amount of money does so much for our community. We're also a really lucky community that half of our, what we spend on the plethora of amazing services and... Um, groups that we look after and, and support is that we have parking money. In a way, your rates go so much further. We live in such a vibrant community because we have that access to other revenue. But I want to get back to the talking about, you know, money, we keep looking at the bottom line. But we started now, corporations are doing it too, looking at the environmental impact, the social impact, because you cannot measure everything by money. So I know 
that some people are bearing the burden a little more than others, and that waxes and wanes in years. But we, as a council, are not responsible for the... Well, actually, maybe we are. The great, part of the great reason that people want to live here, because it is a great community. But we can't actually measure, in a bottom line, the vital aspects that connects us as a community. That social cohesion, that inclusivity, that feeling safe and wanted and um, part of something. And that's all made up of little things. It's funding small sporting, sporting groups or the eco centre or making sure our parks are green and kept, you know, and our footpaths are good and that we provide arts funding for, you know, small and big projects and we look after our foreshore and we keep our streets clean even though at some times our population triples when we have visitors here. There are, there are, we are not just an average council. We are more like a capital city council. We have some of the biggest, most photographed icons in Victoria and Australia that exist and we are the gate, are the, you know, the people that have to look after them. That is our task. We are, we are Melbourne's playground. You know, we, we have to provide level of support and uh, cleaning and all the things that go with it from being much more of a tourist mecca than many other councils. One of the things that we also have always done is we've also been a city that has cared. And all the way back to Albert Jacker, who was helping the men who returned from, from um, war in vulnerable housing, this, these councils that are now combined have always put money towards looking after the vulnerable and housing the homeless. And that is a tradition I do not think that we want to lose. We've also been the gateway to many immigrants who step onto Station Pier and their new lives begin. And now we're faced with a different kind of um, growth in that area, which is more cruise ships coming than we've ever had to deal with before. And that has effects on our community and we also have to deal with them. We are the original home of artistic types. Yes, gentrification means a lot of them have moved out, but we need, to, we need to keep funding them and trying to find affordable spaces because that's one of the amazing reasons why people moved here and gentrified the area. We are also have a proud history of activism in this com community, and that is where we support in all different kind of volunteer groups. We are also home to the biggest redevelopment of urban land uh, in the whole of Australia. And because of some decisions, some really bad decisions made, um, by some other levels of government, we will bear the burden of those bad decisions and that redevelopment far beyond funding a small, perhaps, access to park in Ripon Lee Estate. You know, we built a park, the first of many that we will be part and partnership to build in Fisherman's Bend, and it cost $13 million. And it was, it was a cost that was avoidable if better decision making had been made in prior governments. So make no mistake, when we talk about prudent cost, we are bearing the burden for a, a, some really high level decisions that got made that have left us to carry the burden. So when I talk about 20 grand for Ripponley uh, Estate Access, I keep thinking of Kirat Park at 13 million unnecessary costs and we have got so many more of them coming down the line. At a time when our city is growing and we're also becoming more disconnected as a society, I see our role as being the, the um, keepers of community even more important. Screen time is not connected time. We are funding things like Eco Centre where people meet face to face. And as I said, social cohesion is a funny thing. You might run into someone in the library that we provide or on the street or at that local street festival that we provided funding for or if they're visiting our toy library or our botanical gardens or our beautiful foreshores or volunteering at Beach Patrol. All those little things that may have started as a little idea with a little bit of council support have made this community great. So the money we spend at council gets multiplied by 10 and the small amounts that we give to community groups gets blown out by, you know, a build, an overkill and build. The cyclists on the foreshore with the South Melbourne having to move the forward hoardings because wouldn't, people wouldn't slow down on a bike. There's your quarter of a million dollars. I tell you what, we are really prudent with money and I know our officers do such a fantastic job in delivering to us all the options and always looking at ways that they can create innovative partnerships, find other funding and they are constantly doing that and we are very lucky to have them doing that. But I do say that this budget is a reflection of what we value and I think that this budget does reflect what we value 
and I would urge my fellow councillors to support it. We can talk to the cows come home about where prudency lies, and it's not with this council. We are doing our job. We are, and I would, I would say to you, a hundred times over, our budget could be ten times bigger and we could never take that rates cap if a decision hadn't been made and we're left with fishermen spend as it is. But that's the reality. So it would be irresponsible for us as a council to not looking forward to the challenges of climate change, fishermen spend, a growing city, everything from peaking, keeping parks green to figuring out uh, how to keep amenity when we grow. It would be irresponsible of us not to take the small rate cap and maximise that use. Thank you. Okay, uh, I, I won't close. I was going to, but I won't. I'll move to the vote because I think Councillor Crawford closed for us. Um, all those in favour? Against? Can I request Carried. a division, please? Um, all those in favour? Councillors Copsey, Simich, Brand, Gross, Crawford, Baxter, and against Councillors Pearl and Bond. I declare the motion carried. Um, thanks very much, Councillors. I think we should have a break. Is that OK? OK. I declare the meeting... Um, Re, uh, resumed. Um, 14.3, declarations and, of rates and charges, 1 July 2019 to 13 June 2020. Councillors, there are no questions from the community. Can I ask for um, questions or a, a resolution? Moved Councillor, moved Councillor Copsey. Seconded Councillor Gross. Do you wish to speak? I don't wish to speak. I'll have a quick chat to you if that's okay. Sure. Uh, I vote against this on the basis that I voted against the budget in which this effectively funds. And the, the reason ultimately I'm funding against this is aligned to what was said in many of the previous comments. And that comes down to what our job here is today, as councillors rather, is to balance out the here and now with the long-term objectives and what's coming down the line. There's a number of things in the budget that we considered earlier that feed into this motion here that concern me. The main one is our underlying result of this council. So far, we're $10.4 million negative net position, uh, cumulative underlying result of this council in the three and a half years we've been in. We're burning through fairly large amounts of cash. We're doing some good things with that cash, um, but as we burn through it, we reduce the options available to us in the future. I um, would be happy to support a rate rise uh, of some description under this, this motion, um, but I want to see that rate rise go into future investment so we don't have to become slave to the lender and borrow money, money down the future. We know there's certain challenges that we need to fund 10, 20 years from now, yet we're failing to actually fund them to the full amount. We're making the same mistake the federal and the state government is, and we should be amending that in our budget process. I don't support the rates that are being proposed this evening because I don't support the way that our budget is structured. Therefore, I'd be hypocritical by supporting uh, the motion here this evening. Thanks very much. Anyone else? Uh, do you wish to close, Councillor Copsey? I, I didn't say this when we were um, passing the budget, so I just want to... This is all part tonight of our annual review um, and uh, the commencement of our rating um, for the forthcoming year. I just really want to thank everybody who's been involved in the process. It is, I believe, this year our most um, consultative budget that we've uh, passed yeah, in this council um, in history. We uh, ran during this budget cycle, a deliberative workshop which community um, members participated in, which uh, helped to share the challenge that Council faces um, as we raise revenue uh, in order to fund um, important services for our city. And I thank everybody who participated in that workshop. I thank all of those who have made submissions um, this year. And importantly, I thank the officers who work 
very tirelessly to produce um, a really comprehensive and transparent suite of documents. Uh, we have really, really excellent resources available to those in the community who wish to scrutinise our budget processes as a council. Um, and I think that that's really important. Uh, the scrutiny of how these resources are allocated is welcome. And um, I'm really heartened every year to see the level of participation in this um, process by our community. It is a community, as Councillor Crawford said earlier, that cares very deeply. Um, the rates that we raise and the other, other revenue that Council receives, uh, we're stewards of. And it's our responsibility to invest that in um, delivering fantastic outcomes for our community. I'm very proud. Uh, of the way that we do that. I think um, we're responsible. We operate within all of the relevant um, VAGO indicators uh, to, to maintain a very uh, prudent and sustainable financial position. And I thank the officers for their continued excellent advice in um, assisting us to do that as a council. Uh, I'm pleased to support the officers' recommendation tonight. Thanks very much. I'll move to the vote. All those in favour? Against, declare it carried. 14.4, um, appointment of acting mayor. We have no one who's um, put, put their hand up to speak on this. <laughs> Councillor Simich. I'd like to move. Thanks very much, the officer's rec that uh, Councillor <laughs> uh, Louise Crawford uh, be acting mayor during the mayor's absence from those dates. Do I have a seconder? Seconder Councillor Copsey. Um, speakers? Move to the vote. All those in favour? <laughs> That's unanimous. Um, meeting procedure, local law number two, review. There are no um, contributions from the uh, gallery or questions. So, uh, councillors, do you have any questions? I'm happy to move it if there's no questions. I have a quick question, actually, just about the wording in 3.1. Um, gives public notice of its intention to make meeting procedure local law and pursuant to section two. Seems grammatically incorrect. Does it mean make that public or? No, just to make the law. Just to make the law? We're making law. That's how we say it, okay. I think that's grammatical. Good question. Learn though. something new every day. <laughs> okay, so sorry, I've missed out who moved it. I moved it. Moved it. Moved Councillor Pearl, seconded Councillor Bond. Any speakers? So we've doubled the size of the local law councillors in, in, in page number and in words. So I, I'm sure this will uh, improve our councillor conduct. Well, improve it'll our <laughs> just don't interrupt, Councillor Gross. That's in the current meeting procedure. You should know better. Um, but there's, look, there's some good additions here. But frankly, I would, I, we should have set a limit to say you can you can change it, but you have to confide within the current page limit uh, and font size. Font size. But uh, we'll, we'll see how this goes. I don't think there's any huge material changes. Anyone that should be concerned about. Um, it's been discussed briefly behind the scenes, and I think um, it's been well considered and well received by most councillors. So let's give this a go. And if it doesn't work, we can always come back and change it. Great. Councillor Copsey? Um, yes, I'll just say that this is actually... Um, so the meeting procedure local law... Oh, you want to say something? Oh, I wasn't sorry. Oh, sorry. Go to... Do you wish to say anything? Sorry to interrupt you there, Councillor Copsey. Um, yeah, local law number two, my favourite local law. Um, I love reading this document. Um, <laughs> it's right, we only have two. Um, this one is, is yeah, great and it's... Fantastic to see we've got a new set of rules and changes to to what is the Mayor's meeting. So enjoy, <laughs> Mr Mayor. Okay. Thank you very much, 
Councillor Bond, Councillor Copsey. So submissions are actually um, opened on this. So we won't enact this tonight. It's, um, it's an important document, I think, from the community's perspective as well. So I would actually urge people to consider it and um, to make submissions uh, in the time that's available and then we will um, proceed with making it uh, at the conclusion of that process. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Councillor Baxter. Um, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, uh, I note that, um, as Councillor Pearl said, there, there are uh, not, a, not a huge amount of changes, but some of these are, are, are reasonably important, regardless of their, their font or <laughs> how many words are used to describe them. Um, but one thing I did just want to uh, point out as we put this out for um, people to um, think about is, uh, you know, the, the, um, the changes to Clause 33, voting. Um, so. Uh, councillors are no longer required to vote under this proposed uh, local law. Uh, they can abstain from a vote. Uh, and that would actually be a pretty significant change to how things happen in this chamber. Be. Um, because I think there have been many times when councillors have wanted to abstain but had to pick one side or another. I'm generally more decisive, but I know that others can, you know, perhaps be... <laughs> You might have noticed, um, you know, I wishing, never wishing to abstain, but but that that's an important one, and I think that the, particularly the people that are watching in the live streaming now, we've done the budget, so that there might not be that many of them left, but um, the people that are watching the live streaming now will appreciate that change if uh, if that were to um, go ahead. Okay, Councillor, do you wish to close? I will abstain from saying anything further. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'll move to the vote. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. 14.6, um, Queen's Birthday Honours List. There is no... Um, now, Jen asked me to check the citation for Carolyn, and it's absolutely correct. So the, I, I believe it's correct because the citation, official citation is for significant service to the Indigenous community and I think that's what we've exactly got. It's exactly what so it's correct, I think, Jen. Um, so I just wanted to check that. Moved Councillor Pearl, second to Councillor Bond. Speakers? The highest honour a citizen of Australia can be uh, conferred upon is one of these honours uh, through the Queen's birthday process and the uh, Australia Day process that happens twice a year, these honours are given out. There's lots of people that deserve these that don't actually get awarded them in their lifetime. And it's important to recognise the effort and the services and the great thing these people have done, but you can't always think that, that help but think that, geez, there's a lot of people in... In, um, no offence to you, Councillor Gross, you've actually got one. <laughs> You're the only one here that's got one. Um, but there's a lot of people in our community that deserve these awards, perhaps more so than some people have had them in the past, I would say. Um, and I would encourage everyone to nominate. You need four references. It's a two-page application form. It takes a couple of years to get it done. Uh, I've done it for a few people that I thought were worthy. Um, and I would encourage you guys to do the same. Because um, it's a... Sorry, what was that? Uh, I yeah, Dick Pratt lost him. Well, no, Dick Pratt actually gave it back. Sorry, I think is the factual thing. Right. We have to be careful about people that aren't no longer with us. Um, but I think he actually voluntarily gave it back um, before he died. So uh, it's a huge honour, and I congratulate these solid citizens for their uh, re respective recognition in their fields, and it's hugely warranted, and I wish them all the very best, and the city will send a congratula congratulatory letty letter to them, um, and we honour them, their families... Uh, and their professional and personal achievements. Thanks very much. Any other speakers? Move to the vote. All those in favour? Unanimous. 14.7, Assembly of Councillors. Can I have a motion? Move Councillor Copsey. Second of Pearl. Speakers against? All those in favour? Carried. Um, we now have one short confidential matter, so we have to unfortunately... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um. <laughs> okay. Okay, sorry, I'll go back to my uh, other notes. Um. Notices of motion. Neil. 
Reports by councillor delegates. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, uh, excuse me, councillor Baxter. I'm desperate to hear about the Bayside Municip um, municipalities. Well, you better be. Um, uh, this, the, this, this council has, has delegated um, councillors to go and sit on committees and, and be parts of various bodies, and I think it's um, definitely worth reporting back to this council and the community the kinds of things we get up to. I'll be very brief, though. Um, recently, the Association of Bayside Municipalities um, uh, met up uh, for one of its meetings. Um, uh, it was down in um, Clifton Springs, uh, so... Um, I thought I could uh, quite easily get the, the, the ferry down to Port Arlington and then get a lift uh, over there, but the times didn't line up and I had to end up stealing the mayoral car um, from outside the mayor's house uh, and driving that down there. Um, but it was really quite gorgeous down there and we spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, looking at some of the um, uh, uh, coastal infrastructure uh, that the city of Geelong has. What was really interesting was an artificial reef that they built for the purposes of um, not just um, biodiversity, uh, increasing biodiversity in, uh, along the coast there, but also um, keeping in the uh, uh, preventing the wash away of sand from those beaches uh, in the same way that a rock groin. Uh, might do uh, on our beaches. So it was really quite... In well, maybe I'll say it's more interesting than it sounds when I tell you, but um, it, uh, it, was, it was very good and uh, the ABM is uh, going from strength to strength uh, under a fantastic presidency. And um, I uh, oh, just thought I'd you. report that back. Thank you. Councillor Pearl. I'm privileged enough to represent the City of Port Phillip on the South Melbourne Market Board and just to report quickly that the um, acting executive manager of the market, uh, Mark Edmonds, has been doing a terrific job. He, he's acting in that role at the moment because of our, our previous general manager uh, departed recently. The, to update councillors, we're well progressed on the process of appointing a new manager and that will be announced uh, in due course when a decision has been made, but that's been a public process that many people would have seen advertised. Four of the five... Um, committee members on the um, South Melbourne Market Management Committee are new to the role and I'm pleased to report they seem to be settling in very well and using their professional expertise to uh, benefit the city and the market also. Well, that's great. Thanks for that. OK. Thanks for those uh, verbal reports. Um, urgent business? Councillors, do you have any items of urgent business? Agenda item 18, councillors, confidential matters. Councillors, we have one confidential item tonight listed on the agenda. And I call on a councillor to move that the meeting be closed to members of the public to consider this confidential item moved. Councillor Pearl, seconded Councillor Gross. Um, I'll move to the vote. All those in favour? Declare that carried.